All right, here we go. All right, that looks all right. Looks good, looks good. Welcome everybody. Looks like we're going. Had some technical issues with the speed of the upload, but uh, I think we're going good now. So if, if uh, there's issues with uh, video or audio, let me know in the live stream in the chat. And uh, we've got, I've got Lemon Bird here. Let me pull him in. And Lemon Bird, hello. Hey, how you doing? Good. So it looks like you're on. I'm seeing that you're on. And people, if you can confirm that it. Uh, that he's that you're hearing both of us and uh, all right like a four second lag on the uh, broadcast give or take yeah a little lag that's fine so you know I was wondering what uh, you have two names you have Lovenbird and um, another one right R. Venley that's my name but um, Lemonbird's fine I'd like to give a shout out to uh, 24 7 Flat Earth Discord where we uh, talk about the Flat Earth 24-7. Uh, Make sure to go on Discord and check us out. Yeah. Um, we can put a link in the description if you want. Uh, let's see if I can find an invite link for this technical stuff. Uh, might be able to put one in later. Oh, I cannot. I'm not allowed. We... YouTube censorship. Oh, yes. Link has been shared around the Discord, says they and them. So, well. Sweet. But, so, where does Lemon Bird come from? I'm from North America. Oh, I mean your, <laughs> your name. Oh. Um, my <laughs> avatar has a bird with a lemon. It looks like uh, three birds. Oh. Uh, Two of the birds have their heads cut off, and it looks like a lemon rind, so it's like lemon bird came okay. from that. And that's, of course, the, the avatar I have is uh, is uh, dice. Yeah, I just so picked a random one. I couldn't find my I couldn't find my avatar, so okay, I just the random one. All right. Well, um, before we started, I, I wanted to say last week uh, we on Tuesday we had a uh, debate on the twenty four seven uh, server. And uh, it was uh, it was a little messy with there was a lot of people in there, um, but at one point I was maybe a little short with you, so I'd just like to apologize for that. Uh, I don't mean to be rude or anything, and sometimes it just gets the better of me. Uh, no problems. We get a little excited, you know. It was a bit of a pile on, just a little bit. You know. <laughs> Sorry about. It. Yeah, yeah, it's all right. It was fun. So, all right. What do you want to do? You want to start? Uh, I guess the main thing about um, the flat earth is um, the main proof, I guess you could say, for whether or not we live on a globe or a ball is, you know, three to six miles out for an earthbound observer that's like six feet off the ground, you supposedly see a horizon. Okay, great. You should be able to set a marker at that three to six mile um, boundary and then raise up an elevation and see the land drop from that marker. But it doesn't appear that you do. You appear to see land rising beyond that marker up to eye level, which implies that we're not on a globe and that there is more flat land beyond such a marker because the horizon appears to more or less rise up to eye level. There doesn't appear to be this boundary of Earth that you can focus on beyond which everything drops. So... Have you seen pictures where the horizon doesn't rise to eye level? I have in um, high altitude photos, like 10,000 feet, but that could be explained away with um, atmospherics. You know, thick air refracting the, um, the light in such a way that it appears to dip, but it's a deceptive dip. So, so the, the um, denser air that's lower down compared to the, the less dense air that's higher up, right? Um, I believe so, yes. The air toward the uh, surface would be more dense, I believe. Yeah. Well, yeah, it is. And, like, people that climb Mount Everest know this well. They need, uh, except for a few tough guys, they they need oxygen because there isn't, an, uh, the, the air is too thin up there. 
Um, so wh when that happens, which way does light bend when it goes from a um, um, when the when the medium is is has a, a higher index of refraction down low? Uh, I think a thicker medium makes it uh, refract down, but I, I don't know. Yeah. So if it refracts down, what does that make things appear? If it refracts downward, um, it would make it appear lower, I believe. Actually, it makes it appear higher. Hmm. How so? Um, well, I can show you with a picture here. Which, of course, didn't come up correctly. Oh my goodness, come on. I have something on the screen I'm looking at. It doesn't go. Oh, let me... I got to switch uh, modes. A little bit new at, uh, at OBS. You ever used OBS? Operation Broadcast System? <laughs> Open Broadcast System, yeah. Close. There we go. Almost there. I noticed uh, BM Furball was talking about a theodolite showing the horizon going down. Keep in mind that uh, most lenses have some sort of distorting effect by dint of them being uh, concave shaped. Um, they're going to bend the light in a way that's going to be different than the way entering your eye. So you're going to get deceptive effects like barrel distortion and uh, lens collimating effects that are going to make the horizon appear to dip and even bend in ways that it's not actually doing, or at least not appearing to do when you look at it with your unaided eye. So we have to be careful how much um, uh, credence we put in these optical instruments. They can give deceptive impressions. And theodolites are usually guaranteed up to a certain distance beyond well, which the yeah. deceptive... So, uh, the, uh, so that, that after, yeah, after last week, uh, when the theodolite was brought up, I had a, a, a conversation with a geodetic surveyor. So let's get into that in a minute here. Um, but for now, here I have this uh, Batman here who is looking at a building and uh, the the downward refraction. Uh, what it does is is when the light bends, it's it's the it's the angle that the light enters your eye or the camera or the lens that makes it uh, that gives it its apparent location. So so you can see there in the in this image here that that blue line is the line that the light would take to get from the top of that building to Batman's eyes. And because of the angle that it enters his eyes, that the, the building will appear higher. And that's a pretty common, um, pretty basic refraction. Um, of course, there's, there's when it's hot, especially, there's a lot of different effects that happen. So uh, things are best viewed when, it's, when the refractive effects are less because there's, it's more predictable and less chaotic. So in general, uh, which is how our atmosphere works in general, um, downward refraction causes things to go, uh, to appear higher. So are you, now I don't, are you seeing the, the live stream on the, on YouTube? Uh, yes, yes. Oh, okay, good. I, <laughs> I didn't want to have said all that and then you're not even able to see it, so. Um, does that make sense? It would make sense for cold air, but um, there's a lot of stuff going on with these atmospherics. Um, as you see greater distances, you're also going to see in a greater air column that's uh, thicker in the forward direction. And so, you know, warm or cold, that's probably going to do something to the atmosphere, uh, to the um, horizon line. And um, with the cold air, you know, or thickened air, 
that you're going through, it's probably going to make the light probably, what, bend down through that uh, thicker medium. And so the horizon would, what, dip under those circumstances if you're looking through a thickened air column? As you, know, you know, good high it, will, it will rise because it will refract down, like you said. Through cold air or through a thickened column of air? Through... Because you it, may it, be looking well, through... The important part is that the the index of refraction is changing. If the index of refraction does not change, then it doesn't refract. Um, so if it's if it's a uh, but our atmosphere is constantly changing. So um, or sorry the, the 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 layers of it right down low it's thicker which causes a higher index of refraction and higher it's thinner less pressure causing a lower index of refraction. Hmm. I'd have to look into it more myself, but um, looking through a thickened air column, you know, as you get higher up, um, you would, you know, look through, I guess, a thicker lens that could potentially, you know, make the air refract differently. You're saying that a thickened air column makes stuff refract upward? No. I'm saying that um, an index of refraction gradient, where the uh, gradient, uh, the thicker, not the thicker, the, the higher index of refraction is close to the ground, and the lower index of refraction is high, that will cause light to bend down. So if you're higher up, um, you're looking through a lower index of refraction at a higher elevation? You're, that's where you're at. But because where the, the light originated, it was a higher index of refraction. It doesn't matter whether the light is going up or down through the through the medium, it's the direction of the index of refraction. It always bends towards the higher index of refraction. In that case, I guess it depends on where you believe the light is coming from. Do you believe the light is coming from down below on the earth? Or what a flat earther would tend to think that the horizon is straight ahead in front of you and it's just an optical phenomenon that is not necessarily this hard location from which you know, you're know you getting light per se. Not like, oh, there's the horizon. It's just you know a phenomenon where you know you have all this compression visually you know and it can you know happen it's going to tend to happen in the furthest direction forward you know arbitrarily yeah, yeah. it's not so from below. so whether whether it's it's a, a flat or a spherical uh the light if you're in an airplane for example um the light is originating below you either thirty thousand feet below you if it's flat or if it's if it's a globe it's more because it's distant and it's it's curved away some but either because way, if, it's, um, it's it's coming from the highest index of refraction near the ground towards you at the lower index of refraction. So it's going to bend downwards, causing things to appear higher. Because if the, it, um, the light is coming from the Earth, like you say, well, then, yes, those refraction effects from down below would need to be factored. But if the horizon is what we're talking about, and we're talking about the light coming from a uh, forward direction, uh, infinitely forward and just being a compression zone where you're losing information optically, you would only be concerned with that particular layer up up high that is giving you, quote unquote, a horizon. Yeah. A horizon, an apparent horizon, but not one from below. It's, it would just be infinitely forward. Sure, sure. So then, so then what explains, if the Earth is flat, what explains that it, ref that it appears lower when you're in an airplane? Your own explanation of a lower incidence of refraction being higher up, which would make stuff appear lower, would it not? Applying your own explanation to the logic. No, no, no. When when it's coming from, when you have a, a stacked index of refraction layering like that, it's always going to bend down, which has the, it's, it's non-intuitive, but when it bends down, it appears higher. So you're saying that the light will bend perfectly up into your eye from below through all those refractive layers? Well, never perfectly. There's there's too many things going on for it to be perfect. Right? Mm, there's I, I there's always there's always things going on, but but no matter what, because there there can be layers where you have uh, an inverted refraction index, right? Uh, where instead of going from low to high, it goes high to low for a bit. But there's there's just thin layers of that because eventually it needs it's going to exit that area and go to thinner atmosphere, right? It's heat and and uh, humidity that causes differences primarily 
in the index of refraction of air. Yeah, and refraction is a thing, and you know, refraction does indeed occur. But you know, what it appears to be is that the horizon is just an arbitrary op optical phenomena in the forward direction. And so, if that's the case, you would, um, I think you would tend to take the refraction in that layer in the forward direction. But I don't know, I'd have to study up on it more. Well, I'd encourage you to because, um, this is, uh, um, if you look at the, the old sailing books, they even talk about it and they give corrections for it to, uh, when looking at things lower in the atmosphere to adjust for it, uh, cause things appear higher so that you need to adjust down depending on the apparent elevation. So especially below 10 degrees, uh, these charts, and I can give you links to these charts if you want. Um, uh, yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. Let me grab one here. I'll pop it in the chat, too. I'd be really interested in some of the uh, sailors' accounts of uh, circumnavigating Antarctica. Supposedly, it took about 60,000 miles to circumnavigate it, which would point to an Earth of diameter 20,000 uh, miles. So now, did you, did you do your own research on that? Uh, no, I've uh, just heard... Um, Okay. Different. Uh... So once you do your own research, you'll see that that the entire trip from England all the way back to England was sixty thousand miles. Interesting, because um, a sixty thousand mile Antarctica would accord with the flat model, which is a uh, land expanding ever outward from the uh, northern center, like a, a bike wheel or a bike spoke, with uh, the North Pole in the center of the wheel, and Antarctica being like the rubber rim on the outer rim. Yep. Um, and, and do you like that map? Is that your preferred? Uh, we'd have to argue about the exact sizes and or placement placement of the continents. Even the um, heliocentric uh, globe map appears to have deceptive continent sizes. You look at Greenland and they make it about the size of North America when it's a really small uh, plot of land. Well, yeah, that's, so that's well known. Map. That the, the Mercator projection modifies that quite a bit. Yeah, and the thing about the Mercator projection is Antarctica is on the bottom of the map, and it doesn't look like a freestanding continent. It just goes through the uh, the whole bottom section of it like it's a ring. And yeah. so the Mercator projection appears to be um, a little uh, skewed. Yeah, but on this one, this one looks different, right? We have the right sizes when we look at it here. In Greenland. I don't know if that's because the Mercator, well. well, the Mercator projection appears to have taken the uh, bike's uh, wheel spoke um, shape of the the map with the North Pole at the center, and uh, flatten it out in a square grid. And so the pie shaped slices that you'd have coming from the center, they become square grids, yeah. and you're going to get um, a deformation, especially as you get away from the poles when you try to take a bike wheel um, graph. And instead of making it a pie, you try to make it a square grid. All right. Did, uh, did you see the uh, the link I, I put in there? I saw. Let me see this in the chat. Hold on. So it's a it's a a sailing book from 1766. And uh, I love how uh, I love how their F's and S's look funny. A table of refraction of the heavenly bodies in altitude and it starts starts in uh in it goes up in five minute increments and then how much to adjust so at at uh, zero degrees so like right on the horizon it is appearing whatever you're seeing is actually 33 minutes below the horizon is what they're saying here Are they um, over warm waters or cold Antarctic waters or? The, the, this isn't specifying, um, but they there's this book is there's a lot of there's a lot to these books, um, and if you read you read the stuff on there, there's instructions on on how to to take and best time to take it. But of course, this is just a supplement to the education that a, that a sailor or navigator would have had to have during either schooling or as a apprentice navigator underneath somebody else 
So the primary version of these, or primary purpose of these books is to, to have charts. So they have logarithmic charts and sine, cosine charts um, in this particular one. This, this one is a supplement to the annual one that, that people had to get every year that has different um, positions of the stars. And uh, like, for example, has the every month of the year has a, a chart of where the Jupiter's moons are that uh, they could use that to identify where they are. Interesting. Hmm. Oh, that would help you identify when you are because um, uh, timekeeping was a challenge and until accurate timekeeping they couldn't figure out what longitude you're at as easily yeah it seems like the sun uh goes a little faster um toward um different times of the year which kind of lends credence to the flat earth um uh, theory that the sun spins a little slower toward the north pole and circles over the flat plane a little faster um, toward, um, you know, uh, well, winter for the northern pole, but where, summer for the southern pole, where, for the where uh, southern getting, uh, hemisphere. Where, where have you seen that the sun travels at different speed at different times of the year? Um, it's uh, implied by um, people saying that they're having pro pro uh, problems keeping time with the sun, like it's running a little faster than they'd reckon. It's uh, throwing off their, their clocks and stuff. And there was um, a YouTuber... Um, who recorded how fast it took the moon to cross a frame of video. And in the north, it took like four minutes, but in the south, it took like five minutes to uh, cross, or, or rather vice versa, five minutes in the north, four minutes in the south. It, it basically crossed the same frame of video faster in the south than it did in the north, which would point, you know, by extension to the sun doing the same thing also. So, And that would explain how it can keep the same 24 hours by going faster, as it circles um, a greater distance in the southern uh, hemisphere, so have to look into that. That'd be interesting to see, because um, we know it, it it's predicted on the um, the globe that it's going to take a different amount of time, um, because it has farther to go on different days, and um, but yeah, if, do you have that? That would be a, an interesting video to look at. Or uh, if you don't have it, then maybe uh, you can get back to me on it. Well, yeah, I'll have to get back to you. It's okay. in the YouTube somewhere. So um, <clears throat> we talked about theodolites last week. And as I said, I... I uh, I spoke with, i got to pull up the webpage here, I spoke with a um, geodetic surveyor, surveyor who's an expert who lives his life, his career, behind a theodolite uh, and needs to do all of the, the work to to have it be accurate. And, and uh, correcting for these, uh, for collimation, is something that they know how to do and and it's something that they are, they are to do regularly with their, um, with their theodolite and then if it has issues they send it in for repair but there is there is a there are techniques to correct for for uh collimation by simply doing the measurement uh with the lens flipped the other direction and doing it again and then you're going to get an error or a, a discrepancy and you just take the average of those two interesting so all right i have here the article I wrote on theodolites so I asked him because I'd, I'd seen people talk before um, including last week I think it was Mitty who said it I could be wrong um, and I see he's in the chat so maybe he could he could uh, help you on this I've never seen anybody actually uh, substantiate the claim that theodolites are only rated for a certain distance uh, I asked um, the main surveyor that's his uh, his YouTube channel um, main m a m a i n e about that he said well there is a distance um that is is uh on some that have a laser distance finder which isn't part of the theodolite it's just an added on feature uh and that's specifically he, he gave me some information like he has his leica viva ts16 theodolite that has a specific um 
distance. Uh, it's not it's not a rating. It's a uh, it's a just a statement that they they don't. Um, let's see the range of the long range measurements for these models it says uh, greater than thirty three thousand feet, which uh, and then they have these different range. Um, yeah, Stringer News one is it's a total station. Um, uh, range C overcast, no haze visibility at 40 kilometers, no heat shimmer. So that's more of the same. We don't want these, uh, it, the um, heat and, you know, unusual atmospheric effects that makes it difficult for these things to work. Well, uh, the, it's good that these um, surveyors can correct for it, but um, the main thing are these uh, people that are trying to prove heliocentrism with a vested interest in, you know, the theory and the atheism that it um, uh, engenders going to correct for that factor. Are they just going to pass off, you know, kind of like a, a, a soundly-esque, you know, um, uh, distorted, curved-looking thing? So are you sure that Soundly's an atheist? Um, my, um, uh, point was about the theory. Um, Christians can be deceived as well and push atheistic theories. And, um, I argue that this, uh, results in a split of the mind, a psychological tug of war, trying to, you know, profess, you know, faith and, and keep the faith with these atheistic theories that are trying to, you know, steal your, um, your heart away from the creator. So I'm talking about the theory, not necessarily the people. Okay. Because he's not an atheist. Um, so. Oh, yes, yes. Um, he's, uh, um, he's uh, uh, as far as I can tell, he's a believer as well. But um, the thing is, um, it's uh, further from a creator, a uh, random ball wobbling through space that scientists, you know, keep on trying to convince us over and over again, does not have a special place in the universe, you know, where, you know, um, nothing special, you know, just another accident of evolution. You know, versus, you know, an enclosed system, you know, covered by a vaulted, you know, sky dome with flat land that looks like it was created for our uh, habitation. Um, well, you still have to make that case. Yeah, I only talk about the psychology behind these theories because there's no such thing as a paradigm neutral observation. A lot of times, you know, we've been told stories and we fit our observations into the stories that we've been told, atheist, creator, whatever. And so a lot of times we'll fit our observations around the paradigm that we come from. And so it's important to talk about the psychology of that worldview as well when you get to the heart of some of these theories. Yeah, so... If by, by that model, that, um, then then we have to discount everything from any flat earther as well. Is that okay with you? No observations no, by flat earthers. Fly. Be well, because just they have an agenda. The they have an agenda too. That is true. That is true. Just be honest about where it comes from, and just you know um, be cognizant of that. But uh, also, like on your side, you have Christians. We also have atheists as well. So it, it goes back and forth. Yeah. Okay. So I am. Uh, I'm looking for. I have a um, image from Jesse Kozlowski. I'm gonna pull up. Oh, I'm gonna. I'll do this one here. I have uh, already. So here I have. Um, from uh, Bobby Shafto, a setup he did using um, water in tubes, right? So he's he's at a lower altitude, and he's he's testing. Uh, he's not able to measure. This isn't uh, giving an angular measure, but it's able to see whether or not it actually rises to eye level. And uh, at 90 feet elevation, it does not rise to eye level. Um, I'm waiting for a second for it to show up on the screen there. Um, there you go. So here's two images at 90 feet high where he's using these water level that we know always finds its level. And so we've defined and, and we know for sure that, that we're looking straight on eye level here or true level and, and uh, surveyors have different words for it, but uh, that the horizon did not rise that high. 
And you can even see on that uh, left image there, you can see the Coronado Island in the background there where it, uh, he's, uh, he's at 90 feet and that, that island is um, 200. I'm not sure exactly. I'd have to look it up. But uh, it, it, it rises um, about appropriately on that island. So with this uh, thickened air, how do you know that the thickened air column isn't getting to the uh, point where it's occluding the true horizon beyond? I mean, this stuff can get very complicated. Also, you know, if you even tilt the camera just a little bit, it may throw off, you know, what would be um, a true level to a flat earther, which would be the horizon. You know, the, um, the true level would be, you know, um, uh, toward horizon typically as far out as possible where um, the visual information uh, uh, compresses down to your eye line. Hmm. Um, so, you know, there may be a thickened air column um, obstructing the true horizon beyond, depending. I mean, you'd have to do it on different days. Look at how, you know, um, overcast that day is. Yep. Well, here, here to address your angle of the camera, as long as the tops of the water levels are even, the angle of the camera doesn't matter. So I have here seven pictures I took, um, and it's not super clear because it's a little small on YouTube, but each of those images has a mark on the whiteboard that I made behind it, and the water is lined up with it in every one of those images. So the, the top row there, the camera is low, and so it's high in the frame, then it's middle, and then it's high, and so it's low in the frame. And then on the bottom there, I went to the extremes. I I put the the uh, the camera diagonal and I, I lined it up diagonally and the the second one from the left there you can see it's just hardly visible on the corner of that image yet that distant mark is still right at the line of the water there and then the same with that next image where it's it's diagonally high in the image and so the the camera had to be moved down and then the angle of the camera had to be adjusted so that the water line might uh, lines up. So the angle of the camera, and I've seen a lot of people say that it needs to be in the middle of the frame. It doesn't. This this right here shows that it doesn't need to be in the middle of the frame. I can send anybody that wants these um, all these source images. You can do it yourself too. That was uh, ten dollars worth of gear at a hardware store to uh, to do that. That that liquid is just <laughs> windshield wiper fluid. Um, So the angle of the camera doesn't matter, right? So now your, your point about the, the, the horizon being distant and can it be occluded by, um, by things? And that's, a good, that's a good question. And Bobby Shafto, I don't know if you've ever looked at what he does, but uh, there is nobody that dots T's and crosses I's or dots I's and crosses T's, but he does both for just a good measure. There's nobody that does it like him. He is um, extremely, extremely OCD about his observations, and uh, he has some fantastic ones. Uh, and he goes back day after day after day and does it in different conditions and finds the same results every time. So let me add in while we're at it here. Here's a view from 360 feet. Uh, it's coming up. <clears throat> And uh, the same thing, it's a, it's a close location. You can see the Coronado Island in the background again. There it is, it came up. There's two, two Coronado Islands. There's a third one that's a little smaller, harder to see. The, the, um, the Coronado Islands are part of Mexico off the coast near San Diego. Um, so, oh, hold on, somebody needs a wrench. Oh, no problem. In America, we call it a wrench. <laughs> You remember that um, race, uh, racist hoo ha ha that was over the uh, monkey wrench, supposedly being, you know, like a, a, a calling black people monkeys or something? I heard it wasn't even like about black people because they said the guy who made the monkey wrench was black, so they made it a monkey wrench to make fun of him. But monkey was a term for like anything that's adjustable, like a, a, a monkey ladder and stuff, anything that you could adjust that was called like a monkey blah, blah, blah. And so it's like an adjustable wrench, like a monkey wrench. It's crazy. Hmm. Well, that's cool. Yeah, I've seen people make yeah. uh, make some bit too much assumptions on things. So somebody's wondering about who did these pictures here. It's Bobby Shafto. 
I put a link to his channel there in the chat. Um, I know him. He was on the tfes.org server with me. Um, and uh, he's a nice guy on there. He are going going at it with flat earthers and being nice at the same time. So that's uh, for me. That's uh, that's a model I want to have. So I'm, I appreciate what Bobby does. So all right, the horizon dip, um, and then so the, to to finish out the horizon doesn't rise to eye level um, is the the table again from that same book from 1766 showing um, the different that they put in actually in the book that at different um, <laughs> hold on zero one three two one three two says MC two and if I de defeat one of your mods in unarmed combat can I get a can I get their spanner um, uh, <laughs> look we don't give out spanners on this channel we give out wrenches I'm sorry. Uh, all right. Uh, the the uh, all right. So this horizon dip, and again, I love reading these old these old things because their S's look like F's. So it says a table of the depression or dip of the horizon at, of the sea. Um, that's that uh, text there in the middle. And um, over on the right, you can see there it has uh, from one feet from one foot up. There is a zero minute 57 second dip of the horizon from one foot up. And at 100 feet up, there's a nine minute 33 second dip of the horizon. Um, now, if you use the uh, Al Burundi math to calculate that, you wind up with a number that matches very closely to the 76R uh, for the Earth, which, which of course includes um, standard refraction. So go ahead. That's a little homework for people if you want to try that out. So the claim that the horizon rises to eye level, I've never actually seen substantiated once. Every single time it's been measured, every time, it's never risen to eye level at any appreciable altitude. I've seen people on planes point a camera out the window and say, look, it's at eye level, but never with a measurement. And now uh, we know that with just our bare eyes, we can't measure a few degrees very well. Well, you're never going to get that because um, as um, Southern Protestant uh, said in his Flat Earth Proofs, um, he cited Euler's definition of a point and a point from which you get a line is that which has no parts. Um, there's nothing in reality that doesn't have a part. Therefore, a line does not exist. And therefore, the thing being used to define a line, uh, a bunch of points that it goes through, does not exist either. Therefore, there is no such thing as a horizon line, qua a horizon line that you can focus on. It's just a tendency. Uh, when this stuff, uh, when you're looking at the horizon, where is the does the horizon tend to be? It tends to be at eye level, because that's where the angles, the light angles, are being refocused on in your eye. And as they get further and further away, they are refocused on the back of your eye, on the back of your retina. But the thing is, the lines are getting so close to a point where angular resolution is reached and you're just losing information at the horizon line. The rays that are coming to your eye are so far away, they're basically merging into one and reaching angular resolution. So it's a place that is like um, a, a place where things tend to converge. It's not an actual hard place that you can focus on. And you can focus on it in different ways. If you focus on it a little up, you're probably going to get some dist uh, distortion effects if you focus on it a little downward. You're probably going to get some distortion effects because a line doesn't even really exist because there is no such thing as a point. There is no such thing as that which has no parts for a point, and therefore there is no such thing as a line. It's a theoretical abstraction, but in general, this stuff rises to eye level because that's where the visual information will compress. Now, this will get complicated with weather, with refraction, with atmospheric extinction, with that huge column of uh, misty, hazy air in that picture, but in general, the tendency still stands. Artists uh, swear by it. They make horizon lines in their pictures to give realistic perspective that appears to be at the eye level of the observer. And other effects like that too. This thing is like, it, it, it's in our DNA. 
we, we tend to trust um, that the horizon line is at our eye line, that stuff above our eye line will converge down toward our eye line, and stuff below our eye line will converge upward. It's just, it's just part of us. We don't see a hard horizon of Earth curvature. All right, so no disagreement that the theoretical line and point definition from mathematics doesn't actually exist in reality, but of course we use line in the common parlance to mean things that we see, right? Um, and and you still claimed that the horizon rises to eye level, yet it, it never does. Yes, uh, barring atmospherics, thick, misty air, um, do, weird Do you have temperature, one simmer, example? Like do you have one example? Uh, I would, because it's measure. not a place. It's a place where um, visual information compresses. How do you measure an abstract um, point in space that is not an actual location? With a theodolite, that's one way. With a theodolite that is going to collimate the light and give you deceptive effects that magnify with greater distance and greater elevation, giving you stuff like deceptive elevation drops and even deceptive barrel distortion, barrel distorting effects. But we've already established that collimation can be fixed by <clears throat> normal, uh, normal things that that uh, surveyors do by measuring twice you flip it you do it the other way and you take the average <clears throat> okay number two that's good do you think um the um uh, uh flat earthers uh, i mean the uh, globe earthers uh with an agenda and an axe to grind against you know atheism and you know pro-science fanboys who love nasa and stuff like that you think they're going to do that sure i think that for their job they need to have an accurate theodolite or all of the work that they do is going to be wrong. So if they're not doing their job right, they're going to know pretty quickly because when they turn their stuff in for their clients, they're going to have wrong answers. And then pretty soon they're going to not be employed anymore. So they know how to use their own instruments. So I don't question their ability to use the instrument that is their livelihood. Mm, but what right? about the... Uh, uh all right well i mean you could be right but you know i'm just saying that there are distortion uh, effects that can be um uh made with these um light instruments light focusing instruments by dint of the concave uh shape of the lens it's a bent lens it's not going to give you light that isn't refocused and partially distorted depending but, on the way that I already covered look that, at the gopro that, camera but yeah it's not a gopro <laughs> don't compare a theodol item a many thousand dollar instrument to a GoPro camera that has a plastic lens. It's a completely different it, thing. So the, the, the lens principle. The, the lens in there is designed and and carefully uh, calibrated so that they know the exact amount that it's off. And even when it's off, they know how to fix how much it's off by, by measuring from the opposite side. But no instrument is perfect. Even the best telescopic instruments have a slight distortion effect by dint of their shape. That These instruments are not perfect, and it will magnify with great distance and elevation, just like with the theodolite. All right. So you're I love this. You're saying that that um, no instrument measures perfectly. Did you hear that mm -hmm. uh, meme uh, war vet? Just so you know, uh, no instrument measures perfectly. Uh, and you're right. You're right. It, it's only as good as it's uh, claimed to be. So, for example, the theodolite that the main surveyor uses, the Leica Viva TS-16, is accurate to one arc minute. Uh, just a hmm. second here. So he, he can measure to one arc minute accuracy. Uh, and with, with how collimation errors can be corrected... He can measure accurately to within one arc minute. Now, they don't just take one one measurement when they do things. They take multiple, and then they take a statistical averaging from it uh, so that so that you have three, five, seven, or, or more uh, data points to use to, to average in to get your, um, your average point. If the standard deviation is too wide, then they know there's a problem, and they'll take more measurements. Interesting. So, um, th there's a lot of information on theodolites out there, and and it wasn't hard for me to find. Um, I found two videos uh, of um, 
how to correct collimation, or not a correct, how to measure collimation in a um, theodolite, and then to know what's the acceptable amount. Uh, and that's on that web page that I posted. I'll post it again, uh, the, the two videos on the bottom. It just shows how how you, um, how a surveyor is, is to, uh, however regularly they're supposed to, um, calibrate to see if they're within um, within specification and this particular one has a um, you know you, you see in, in the um, the video what the actual margin of error is allowed to be but you're right then the, the next part that that as as you as that light travels farther through the atmosphere there is more um, modification to it Right. And and as we already went over, that will cause things to appear higher, not lower. Hmm. Yeah. And taken with the fact that you can't put a marker three to six miles out from which the land falls away. Um, it looks like we have flat level land that goes out, you know, very far. And at best, you're getting a weird distortion effect by dint of the lens. Um. <clears throat> yeah, I don't, but I don't see that, you see. Um, let me see if I have, no, I don't. I've got a couple here that I will drop in. They're not with a, they're with the Theodolite app. Have you ever used that on a phone? Theodolite app? Yeah, there's a Theodolite app. Here we go. There we go. So you uh, you calibrate the Theodolite app um, when you're uh, when you're near the sea, ideally, or at, at a low level, and then um, so it's coming up now. Not that one. The next one. This is from Brainy Beaver. Here we go. So you see, this is where you calibrate it. And then the next one here, he was on a plane. And he... he <laughs> and I appreciate Brainy Beaver. It's not a free app. What is it, five bucks? I did the same thing. And then and then I didn't look on how to use it before I got on the plane. And I totally didn't, <laughs> didn't use it right. I ain't paying for nothing. So. <laughs> It was just, it was like five bucks. Brainy, did, was that right? Or no, is that not Brainy? Is being furball? He's hey, that's from me, not the beaver. Yes, I'm sorry. You have a B in the name. How can you keep it straight? Um, but yeah, you're not French, so being furball. Thank you. Um, so anyway, so here uh, here's another another image of, of from the plane where it's not rising to eye level. Um, I wish I I I, I have. Um, I have one from Jesse Kozlowski that I'm not. Oh, there it is. There it is. Ah, oh, that's a good one. So, do you know who Jesse Kozlowski is? Um, YouTuber. I've heard of him a little bit, seen his name once or twice in some yeah. of the circles. So here is his his uh an image from his th theodolite. Um, and you won't see it just for a second here, but this is taken from a uh, pretty low elevation. And uh, he has the log books here I'll pull in too. And as a good surveyor, he has all the details in it. I'll go back to this. Um, <clears throat> so that is a, um, I'll go back. It's a lighthouse at distance and you can, and the theodolite has been leveled. It has internal mechanism to level it. So it's looking straight out. So that crosshair there, that horizontal crosshair, is eye level or true level. And then here's his logbook. I don't, I don't understand this. He didn't go over it. But this one here has a little more detail. I don't think he, yeah, he didn't give any um, numbers in there. But you can see... He's talking about the horizontal tangent plane is what when they, they don't say eye level, they say horizontal tangent plane. 
mm-hmm. horizon, horizontal, you know, uh, tends to rise to eye level. I mean, it just looks like it's the point where, you know, there's optical compression at the um, the eye line. But where you, you, it, keep, you, know, hold on. The, you keep saying it rises to eye level, and I've shown you over and over again, nothing rises to eye level. It never does, even at low elevation uh, of this particular one here. It doesn't rise. But you showed me a hazy, you you showed me a hazy picture that's probably suffering from misty thick air. Show me that same picture during a sunny day without um, that much thick air. But you I mean, it, it varies from sunny day to day, day, but it tends to rise to eye level. <laughs> you you can't say that until you show me one image that that has it rising to eye level, one time measured to eye but, level. But this is what drives a uh, flat earthers insane. You know, know, you show this hazy like this is supposed to be definitive proof. I mean, come on, show it during a sunny day. Okay, go ahead. Show it during a sunny day. I've never seen it measured by a flat earther rising to eye level once. Never once. Do you well, have I guess images looking... of it rising to eye level measured? This is something this is something that's so axiomatic. It's like people just take this for a given. When do you not have the uh, horizon rise to eye level in without this image, some sort of this big in this lens, image we're looking at uh, right now? atmosphere or something like that. But you showed me a hazy day. Show me during a bunch of different days. I hate to move the goalpost on you, but this goalpost needs to be moved. You show me a hazy day, I'm going to have to call BS. All right. Just a second. So now, any flat earthers in the chat, maybe you can find uh, find some images that are measured um, of it rising to eye level at altitude. Not just pointing it out the window of your camera and saying, oh, it looks there. Measured. So... All righty. Also show uh, the uh, uh, globe land that's curved falling away from a marker placed three to six miles out um, as the horizon is uh, when you're six feet off the ground. That would be awesome. Oh, you're looking at one right now. Do you see that on the screen there? That marker? That's a lighthouse. Hold on, let me uh, refresh. <laughs> Part-time vegan. When you station, oh, the just a second. Fall away from that one. Oh, yeah, okay. hold on. Oh, the uh, part-time vegan says, looks eye level to me. The water line is about midway in the frame. We've already established that mid frame doesn't mean anything. Um, uh, you, you maybe missed that part of it. Um, but yeah, the, 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 the position in the frame, I'll just pop to it quick here. Uh, the position of the frame doesn't matter. Um, and here it is right here. There I, there are seven images where the I had uh, the water leveled, and in the distance I had the same mark lined up top of the water, top of the water. I never touched that water level. I never touched the mark on the on the board there. I just moved the camera around. You're free to try that yourself. It's pretty cheap stuff to try. How do you know zero? It's a good question. He's using a theodolite, which is a very expensive piece of machinery that has one job to measure angles, and it must, must, must be leveled it must point straight if it doesn't they're not going to be able to do their job and they're going to have bad results and then they'll have no customers and they'll get fired well i mean it's pointing straight i mean with the thickened air column yet again it's another picture with a uh, um, a thickened air column uh could it be you know um you know leveling you know um to you know straight but not necessarily leveling to the horizon maybe parallel to the horizon or rather parallel to the horizon line that you'd get um, uh, during perfect conditions. I mean, you can still get level without necessarily pointing to the horizon. 
I mean, you just have it parallel to the uh, to the infinite horizon line out beyond. And uh, a flat earther would tend to tell you that um, stuff converges down toward eye line, so the true horizon would probably be closer to that um, water line unless there's a thick column of air obstructing the uh, the truer horizon beyond. But you see to, seem to see uh, stuff uh, converging uh, toward the uh, water line and, and setting behind uh, that uh, line. So that would probably be the true um, horizon. You could point, you know, a theodolite up higher than that and still go parallel, but it wouldn't be the horizon line. And yet again, I say that there's no such thing as a point, therefore no such thing as a line. So you can focus on this arbitrary um, horizon line in many different ways. You could point to the top of this line. I mean, if you zoom in on a line, it's going to take on some thickness. So you could point to the top of that line, you could point to the middle of that line, or the bottom of that line, and probably get some different results depending on you know how far you zoom in. All right. That's so, why there's no such thing as a line, because a line will take on thickness if you zoom in on it the moment you draw it. There's yeah, no yeah. such thing it, as a point, and there's no such thing as a line. Yeah, I already agreed to that, that the theoretical mathematical point and line isn't something that exists in reality. It's something that we use in common parlance, right? So here is another image of a rather clear day, and you can see things behind it that look like clouds. It's not super clear. Uh, but you can, oh, it's a little blurry on the stream. Sorry, it's my upload speed is a little chunky today. But uh, you can see here, again, water level. And here's the setup here where he has uh, a tube between these two tripods. And again, from 70 feet high, it doesn't rise to eye level. So once again, it doesn't rise to eye level. So anybody in the chat, maybe you have something. Maybe you can point a link to a measured eye level uh, horizon thing. I've never seen it. Why, why isn't it level? It looks like it's um, uh, slanted up slightly to the left. You have more space between the line and the water on the left than the right. Why? I don't know. I mean, stuff like that, you know, it, it, it makes me very suspicious. So, so would, would, that, would that make the difference then? Do you think that would uh, make it come to eye level? I mean, that's, you know, enough to set off my, you know, suspicion to be like, okay, maybe there's something, you know, focusing going on here. Possibly it could be a true horizon line still, but, you know, shouldn't it be matching the water? Unless there's like some sort of wave or crest or some sort of tidal thing going on, I guess. But I, I don't know. I'd have to look into this, too, because, you know, this light stuff can get pretty complicated with the air, the refraction, the lens, uh, the barrel distortions, collimation, all that uh, stuff. Yeah, collimation, you don't get to bring up in theater lights anymore. Um, despite the fact that Samuel Robotham talked about them in the 1800s, talked about the fact that you get uh, fake um, um, drops in elevation with the theodolite because of collimation, even fake curvature effects. He talked about this back in the 1800s. Yeah, in, and I, um, I quoted, his, uh, I quoted him. I quoted him in my theodolite um, um, article uh, on my website, and and uh, again, I'm going with the many many professional surveyors rather than him who is not uh, skilled or knowledgeable in that field but you need to bring in so many different things to analyze this stuff the way that they're pushing this paradigm you know for nasa for atheism you know they're small time players but they don't get the whole picture you have to study all of this stuff to to get why they're they're pushing a globe versus a flat model so so you think that all all uh, geodetic surveyors that are talking about this are NASA and uh, atheists. They may be deceived. Not all, just some. Okay, so so they look through these every day. They know what they're doing. They have to measure these angles, and they have to be good That's, at it. But notice how I said you could get a perfectly straight angle, yes, that could be going parallel to the further horizon beyond just as easily. You know, okay. as long as it's straight, it's the main thing. But is so it again, pointing at... Again, horizon? let's find one. One measured picture of the horizon light rising to eye level. 
Never have I seen it. Never. And I watched 200 Proofs. It's item two in 200 Proofs. And you know what? It wasn't measured. He just has pictures of things pointing towards the horizon, but it's never, never, never well, um, measured. Like, I mean, just as we're never going to have this, you know, gravity, you know, put in a jar or, you know, really, you know, quantify, you know, in a, a physical way that will be satisfactory to show that planets make perfect balls. Uh, we're probably never going to find the horizon line because it's an arbitrary point in space where stuff converges. It'll converge differently to that point, depending on the, the medium that the light is passing through. If it's, you know, hot, cold, thick air, thin air, um, you know, atmospheric refraction, you know, and stuff like that. So we're, we're probably never going to find this point, you know, consistently. It'll vary day to day. But it tends to converge at the eye level of the observer. Never once. Never once has it done Not that. Even. I've never seen it once. <laughs> so stop saying that. And I haven't seen any flat earthers. Uh, there's, you got some friends in here, but never, never. Part-time vegan. You haven't proven that it's not rising to eye level. You're looking at the image right now, buddy. Um, Shout yeah, out to uh, right part-time. Keeping it flat. <laughs> so, <clears throat> all right. Well, there's there's some homework. Find one, just one, please. I'd, I mean, more would be would be good, but just one horizon rising to eye level measured, not just pointing the camera <laughs> I saw there's a video by uh, is it Victoria BC flat earth something it was her one and only video where she's in an airplane and she's pointing it from the middle of the cabin right so that the it's way over there is where the window is and she points to her camera over there and then she turns around and points it out the window over there she's like look it's rising to eye level and it's all over the place and there's no measurement it just you know it's just somewhere in the window there well, I mean, infrared images show up to a thousand miles of flat level land. No angling over a globe or anything. Oh, it looks, do, you know, pretty I flat. do love Jay Tolan Media's uh, stuff. He is he is a fantastic uh, earth shape asset. The, the San Jacinto one is awesome. I love it. And, and it's good it's in the infrared because it's so crisp. You can see how 6,000 feet of that mountain is hidden. Well, uh, flat earthers are basically saying you're getting stuff that's appearing to disappear over a curve, but it's not disappearing over a curve. It's just optical compression because you're uh, close to the flat plane beneath your feet. And now, if you get okay, higher off that, of the that's flat a, plane, you that's can a good describe point. a wider angle. That's a good point, and, and it was brought up last week because things do... Uh, uh, disappear bottom first as you go over but now the problem is i've not seen in in any publication any s physics journals in any optical books anything that talks about how that happens um in general it is uh um none none of that right if it's not obscured if there's nothing in the way you see it so there appears to be this idea that there's some sort of a uh, predictable and, and repeatable thing that's happening where if it's close to the, the the flat horizon that it should disappear, right? Well, um, I know you've seen those um, uh, focusing charts for a con uh, convex lens where you have F1 and F2 beyond the lens and F, uh, F1 in front of the lens and F2 behind the lens. Basically, you have to have two rays to make a 2D image in your eye. Um, so as you get further and further away, these two rays that are coming from the object are going to get uh, at a narrow angle. And in the middle of those two rays that are coming off the object, you have um, a line in the middle that's going to be, you know, basically, you know, um, not going to be flipped when it enters your eye. Um, it's just going to enter your eye more or less straight. Those lines are going to get closer and closer together to the point where it's going to get to 0.02 degrees around there of angular, the limit of angular resolution and be so close, your eye is not going to differentiate them as two rays anymore. It's going to become one ray and you're not going to see a 2D object anymore. That's going to happen at the horizon. 
especially when you have the flat plane beneath your feet converging up towards your eye line and competing for your vision with uh, you know rays coming off of it too. So basically when you're close to a, a flat plane, stuff is gonna tend to disappear bottom first, especially tall stuff that's sticking up out of the flat plane like a mountain, a building or something like that. So it's not going over the curve, it's just being optically compressed. Okay, so then this must be something that is well known and published in, in uh, there's a predictable model for this? Um, probably not wrapped around the uh, flat earth paradigm. They probably try to um, remain cognitively dissonant and maintain the globe earth paradigm with that knowledge not applied to a flat earth system. So what, what do you mean? That's the power of perception. What, what, who, who, who when, when studying optics would say, oh, oops, we stumbled onto something that uh, we shouldn't be talking about. Let's avoid it. Is that what you're saying? No, people are just busy. They don't think about this stuff. It takes an awakening, like a renaissance for people to wake up and no, be like, no, oh, this is, a, this is an I, optical I, I, effect. This is an optical effect that you're claiming exists, but but nowhere in the anywhere does this happen anywhere except for ad hoc reasonings um, to explain a flat earth model. So so to, to actually support it, you, you should be able to have some sort of a predictable formula. Um, yeah, the, the math is in um, Life of Short's video. Um, uh, he did all the calculations and he has the formulas in there. But um, uh, I'm, I'm not well, that. Not I'd like to see that video. Was this the one that somebody was talking about last week? Yeah, I think I linked it in uh, that discussion. I'll try linking it here. Hold on. Right. Let's see. Life is Short is a YouTuber who did like a, a three hour video in depth on how um, your eye would work over a flat plane. Let me see if I can find it. Uh, let's see. I'll link it in the chat. Well, you, you go ahead and do that. I'm going to talk about it. I see our uh, crash is talking here. Um, Tommy will be back up next week and it's game on. And Fish Guy, Fish Guy wants to take Tommy down. I don't know. Tommy's Scandinavian. He doesn't take any crap. And he's got a zero for an O. Back off. Oh no. Yeah, in, in Gronvald. I'm sure I said that wrong. I'm sorry. But I'm glad your back crash is your uh, your router uh, getting fixed. Relative speeds are a thing, so is scale. And then someone's <laughs> zero one three two one three two. <laughs> Part-time vegan, does does this prove dirt rises above eye level? Nice picture of dirt. <laughs> All right. Hey, Tau Seti Alpha. Uh, all right, so did you did you find that that video? Uh, Lemon? I'm pasting it now. Okay. Um, good. Let's see. Uh, index, oh gosh. Do with this link. Oh, for God's sake. Hold on. Oh, this thing's so slow. It's Angular Resolution in Our World by uh, Life is Short. Life is is one word. Okay. Life is short. So Lou Natick says Johnson Theodolite, 400 feet max measuring distance, 5 arc second accuracy. So where is the 400 feet measuring distance document, please? Because my guess is that's a total station and it has some sort of a distance measuring thing that's apart from its theodolite function. And being that it has a five arc second accuracy, it's not a, a quite as high of end of a theodolite as some of the other ones that are available. But I've never seen anyone um, ever put in any uh, any sort of documentation on the maximum manufacturer recommended distance for a theodolite for measuring angles. Yeah, but um, if this uh, principle didn't work on your eye, you wouldn't be able to tell if stuff is above or below you accurately. 
stuff that's above your eye line would tend to converge down to your eye line, and stuff below it would tend to converge up, giving you an accurate gauge on your 3D world. If that wasn't the case, something below you could be above you and vice versa, with no real definitive way to tell. Uh, I don't know with what that means. Principle in place, uh, with that principle in place, you're going to get a horizon line converging at your eye level. That's except, just logical. Except never once has it. So, got it. Doesn't make sense. So, logically, you're saying that something that's below your eye line can appear to be above your eye line and vice versa over a flat plane. That's basically the logical implication of what you're saying. If stuff does not converge to your eye line, with stuff above your eye line converging down to your eye line, and stuff below your eye line elevation converging up towards your eye line like the train tracks. That's the implication of what you're saying. I'm, I'm just saying never once has I have I seen a measured uh, horizon rising to eye level. Fair enough. But if it's so. negated, like you may be implying, then something that's below your eye line and elevation will appear above your eye line and vice versa. Due to refraction? It could happen with refractive effects, yes. But if there was no baseline where something above your eye line converges down, like the street lamps in, uh, that are taller than you converging down towards your eye line, and something below your eye line converging up like the train tracks, well, then you'd have this weird, bizarre world where the train tracks could converge down towards your eye line despite being below you, and the street lamps could be below you but yeah, converge. Yeah. yeah, you're right. It it they they don't they don't do that. Um, and I have an image up now about how depth perception works or um, perspective, right? Everything above converges down. Everything below it converges up. Um, yeah, that's why a lot of times you have to work these ideas out to their conclusion. And then it, it tells you how, you know, bizarre some of these notions are. Yep. You know, yep. it is now taken he... axiomatically as a given that something above your eye line converges down without refraction and word effects and something below your eye line converges up. That's what gives us perspective. Uh, here, Ron Shekelson. Just a second here, Lemonbird. Says, I'll debate you next. Your mods are timing me out for no reason. Um, don't see... Uh, I'll scroll back quick. I don't see any timeouts um, quickly. But, uh, uh, you know, if, if you're saying something uh, offensive, then, yeah, you get timed out. If you're If you're just making claims with no support at all, I guess they can, you know, that's, that's not too bad. But, uh, you know, if you have some point, you can say, yeah. And next week, nobody's booked for next week. So mctune at mctune.net or join my Discord server. The link's in the description of this video and all my videos. Uh, I'm just mctune there. If you find me on Twitter, mctune27. So there you go. Uh, you can find me pretty easily, however you like. He has this. Oh, I, I. That's fine. You have a screenshot. I, I believe you. I'm. I just didn't see it. So, um, again, I'm talking to, um, uh, who? Ron Shekelson. So, uh, was it you as Ron Shekelson being timed out, or were you in as a different uh, uh, user? But, um, all right. So, uh, get back to that. Send me an email, Ron. The the thing here that we're looking at this how depth perception works. Um, uh, these things can actually be calculated. It's not that difficult. Uh, I have a video where I, calc I derive the angular uh, perspective formula. Um, and here is the final slide from that one here where we have the two, the uh, angle is two times the arctangent of G over two all over R, <coughs> uh, where G is the actual size of the thing that you're looking at and R is your distance to it. Um, we can actually go one easier than that and just use triangulation when we're, we don't need to, when we have a reference point, like for example, the horizon. So, oh, Mandelbrot well, set is, hold on, I'll go back to this, uh, Ron Shuckleson. Mandelbrot set saying I timed it out for ignoring my question three times. So, hey, Ron, answer his question. So, all right, so we can calculate uh, how high something is, right? So if, if I, uh, if we go to those phone poles, Right, and we can see that one phone pole down there is a hundred feet away, and it's a uh, hundred feet high. Make it easy, right? We know the angle to that is going to be forty-five degrees. 
right? And if it goes farther away, and, and if we know the right parts of that triangle, we can solve it and know all the rest of the triangle, right? So if we know, if we know the angle and we know the distance, we can, um, we know how high it is. If we know how high it is and the distance and it's a right triangle, we know the angle. All these things we can figure out, right? Now I know that, that you've done, you must have done some math because I heard you talking about derivatives and integrals before, right? Me? Yeah. Uh, I've done a little, yeah. A little, yeah. So, um, uh, sorry, I'm looking back at, uh, at Ron again. So, so what, what do you, uh, just do, do you agree with that, that we can use triangulation to find, uh, find angles and find distances? Your formula is based off of being centered on the object. Um, it gives you a cone with the middle of it centered at your eye line. If the object is centered in the eye line, yes, but that's impossible with um, something sticking out of a flat plane and you being only six feet. The object effectively will be mostly in the top half of your visual field, changing the shape of the cone that you're going to derive that law off of. Sure. Also, when a large object um, reaches up and up and up in a higher plane, it's subtending the same angle, but that angle is reaching out and touching more of the object like a fan. If you open up that fan toward the top of the object, it'll be the same angle, but that angle will cover more of that uh, uh, portion of the top portion of that object. And so that's going to mess up your uh, calculations as well and give you deceptive angular size measurements with great distances, magnifying that uh, discrepancy. Yeah, so what so happens though with- will die, But over a flat plane, it may be problematic. With with greater distances, right? That's that's where the, the, the R in this formula. Uh, with greater distances, that causes the entire contents of that arc tangent to go towards zero, right? And arc tangent of of um, of zero is very close to zero. So, but um, what happens is as things stuff. get farther away, this particular formula isn't. Um, it actually gets better, um, and and actually when you're the the formula for a flat object that's completely orthogonal to your view is this formula, right? And, and as something is maybe tipped away, if you're looking here and it's tipped away from you this way, the formula isn't completely accurate. But as the distance is farther, that inaccuracy uh, shrinks to extremely small amounts so that we can, we can it's outside of our um, measurement ability or outside of our, uh, I forgot the words, <clears throat> margin of error. It's outside of our margin of error. And, uh, and so the formula actually for a sphere versus a flat object is arc sine instead of arc tangent. But because at, at very great r, uh, arc sine and arc tangent and just zero are very close to each other. So it, it, uh, it, it, it gets within the margin of error. So greater distances increase the quality of this formula. Well, the only thing is um, this formula is, you know, good if your eye line can center on the middle of the object, like if it's flying in the air or something like that. But when it's sticking out of a flat plane, you're going to be looking up and at an angle to get the middle of a sure. mountain or yeah, get the so, middle so, of like a building. Yeah, so it's easier then to and just use triangulation. And some of the bottom, but you're also going to lose some of the bottom of the object in the distance to optical compression. So you're going to be sectioning a part of the object that is still visible while the bottom part will have vanished into the optical compression. So that's gonna mess with your measurement as well. So, <laughs> like things get eaten up, huh? Just just being far away, the bottom of things just uh, arbitrarily get eaten up. Yeah, because you're too low to the flat plane. You don't have a wide enough angle to get the two, you know, light rays to give you a 2D uh, uh Yeah, but, but uh, if, we're looking, if we're looking up, we're not looking it. down here, right? We're not looking at the bottom. We're looking at the top of an object. This top of the object you're not claiming is being compressed like this is somehow inexplicably be, being compressed, right? This is not being compressed. Why would the top of the object be in the wrong place? 
because of what's happening it's, down low. Uh, Life is short goes over this. Um, it's still subtending the same angle, but the thing is that angle is covering a wider part of the object since you're not six feet off the ground from your eye line down. You have infinite room from your eye line up. So you have all this room for a wide angle to see, but it's still subtending the same angle. And so when something like the sun that is still going through, say, one um, angle of vision up in the top, which is a, a great distance because it has a lot of room to, to work with in the top, is setting, it's um, hardly changing any angular size at all because it's still subtending the same angle, but the, the vanishing line is set by the bottom part of your vision. So when it finally sets, it's hardly changed at all, but it's still setting into that um, uh, uh, um, limit set by the bottom part of your vision. Life is short, goes over it. It's a little, a little technical. It, it better be good because uh, this is all sounding like BS to me. It's 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 very very good. Three uh, hours. Three hours? Oh my gosh. Uh, three hours and twenty three minutes. I suggest watching it on the way into work and back. I don't yes. have that long of a drive. It'll take a month. Oh shoot! Uh, <laughs> Fifty minutes. minutes there, you know. I have a ten minute drive. Um, ten minutes. <clears throat> Oh, shoot. I live in That's Minneapolis, like 20 man. It's not that far. I I, uh, mm. I, I, I work Record in a suburb time. and I live in a suburb, so. Shoot. Record that, John. It yeah. is good. So, all right. Uh, let me. I want to try to get that because. Uh, get the right link for it. The The thing is, I've, I've seen. I've seen. There it is. I found it. I've seen flat Earth videos trying to explain things, and I gotta say, they're usually crap. Well, they're you know, we don't crap. have a. Well, we have a bunch of independent thinkers. You know, different schools: New Age flat Earth, Christian flat Earth, um, scientific, logical. You know, so uh, we don't have a magisterium as of yet. You know, telling us you know what to think about the flat Earth theory. We have a bunch of different schools kind of popping up and stuff it's pretty interesting it is and the infighting is crazy too um is is it an infinite plane or is it not <laughs> yeah it's i would tend to say it's, it's not an infinite plane because then the air would just expand out forever it has to be enclosed on some level to have air pressure but i don't know maybe there's an infinite plane stir who can explain it to me yeah well they say there's more land of course um, um, all right. Um, so if it's not infinite, then gravity would pull it into a sphere. Well, uh, gravity appears to be a post hoc theory to explain, um, the globe presupposition. It was assumed that we were on a ball and people were like, well, why don't we fall off of the thing? And so they created gravity as a post hoc explanation for it, but they didn't really have any proof from nature of stuff attracting anywhere but down. If it was truly omnipresent in nature, you should be attracted to your bookcase, attracted to upwards, downwards, left, right, at a slant. It appears to be this force that is used to explain this, you know, globe presupposition. Now, if you find that the land is flat, you can just make another post hoc explanation for that. Well, you make a good point. It should be laterally uh attracting each other and it and it does um and it's measured you're talking about uh, um the cavendish experiment i'm talking about the many many times that the torsion bar experiment has been done successfully and had the same results well my workaround for that is the ether inviting back in the ether which was abolished uh, prematurely um, because of its implications for a non-rotating stationary Earth with ethers gently swirling above it. It was just abolished by Einstein and them because they didn't want to deal with the implications for, you know, a creator, God, the fall of Copernicanism and all that. I would say that the ether is being differentially um, absorbed and released by these um, torsion balls, by the balance itself swirling around it, leading to motions. You could probably get a motion in the torsion balance from, you know, tectonic activity, electricity electromagnetism a wind you know it's just uh, so it's not conclusive and, and uh, mass attracting mass is so general what in the mass is doing the attracting it just seems like sloppy science uh yet mass subtracting mass is observed measured confirmed well i mean uh 
if people are biased, you know, they'll they'll, you know, twist the results and the findings around their bias. So who is watching these scientists to make sure they're not just making up whoppers? Making up whoppers to protect their careers, their their cherished worldviews, that sort of thing. So um let's invite back in the ether and see what we get when we invite back in the ether. Well, first first, ether is an assum- assumption. So without any evidence, we're going to say sorry. We're not inviting it back in. Well, uh, Sagnac reproved the ether. Airy, Michelson, Morley, Michelson, Gale. If you look at it from a flat Earth perspective, it looks like they proved the ether. Uh, when they didn't, though, unfortunately. So um, none of them concluded that, and uh, you are you are basing it on more assumptions. So until you have like some definitive proof of ether, um, uh, I, I need something better than that. So yeah, and and if uh, so here zero one three two one three two for six dollars and sixty six cents said if the ether were swirling, <laughs> the, the Michelson Morley experiments would have had different outcomes, uh, and that's a fantastic um, thing. So so if if as uh, as would be um, you know it, it, how is the ether making mass attract mass even because the ether or aether was all about light uh yes um usually you need um a a medium to have a ripple or a wave like when you drop a drop in the water you get waves light is making waves but they're like oh no medium uh they don't really tell us why i mean even when you look at a vacuum uh supposing that there's nothing in the vacuum uh, yet light still being propagated may uh, be a bit of an assumption because you still have neutrinos passing through solid barriers, which um, shows the potential for a an electrical uh, medium to still be present in the tube, even in a, even in a vacuum. So the ether was, you know, abolished because Michelson Morley um, uh, found um, uh, uh, ether swirling gently above the Earth at about one to ten, I believe, kilometers an hour, miles an hour, something like that. And um, they found it gently swirling over the stationary, non-moving Earth. And well, so they had to abolish those results. Otherwise, it would be the end of Copernicanism. People would be put out put out on their you know butts with no okay. career. So, and so, so they had can to protect you, can their you paradigm. Link, can you link the evidence to that then? Uh, that somebody talked about it in a video. Hold on. Let me link the video. <laughs> oh, yeah. Hey, Gleam. How you doing? Um I see you there. The end. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, what were you saying? He's always good for a little bit of funniness here. Flat Earth can be cylindrical and have a depth of 4,243 kilometers and not collapse according to Gauss's law. Could be cylindrical, except observations don't match that. So could be. Well, I mean, so far. that's a... I, That's I was kind just of a play on- talking a gleam. Oh gosh, gosh. <laughs> and then he's saying, uh, "Are you aware that space time is ether? Like, it, it, you call you know, it's just semantics. You can you can call it you know, Twinkie if you want. It's you yeah, know, twi- Twinkie that- filling. It's it's all twi- It's the bending of Twinkie filling that is uh, is uh, causing uh, gravity. But here's the deal. It all comes down to this: Does gravity attract gravity? Or sorry, does mass attract mass? And we have lots and lots of evidence for that. So I pasted, I, I pasted in chat one experiment. Oh my goodness, I have, I have two computers going and two mice. And here it is again. It is 13 tons of mercury that they used over several years in a, a really cool experiment um, to measure the gravitational constant. I'm gonna get up the. Um, the it's probably here. the ether constant. Um, these uh, scientists, when they get it wrong, um, these organizations, government and stuff like that, they they sweep it under the rug and try to gently massage the functional parts of the model that they rejected back in there. Like no ether, but quantum fluid, um, space time, you know, everything but the medium that they rejected. 
And so you're going to see an attempt to gently massage back in the stuff that they rejected, the functional stuff um, uh, that was part of what they rejected. Um, look at the LIGO experiment, you know, trying to detect gravity waves. They're probably detecting ether waves. Um, you know, it looks like, you know, kind of like a modified Michelson-Morley experiment with all those tubes and all that stuff. But, um, you know, you just got to watch, you know, uh, where the experiments go. And um, you, you see that they're, you know, trying to massage some of the stuff that they rejected back in there. Yeah, yeah, but that doesn't mean that mass doesn't attract mass. That's the thing. <laughs> you, you you still didn't establish any any framework for for mass not attracting mass in all of these experiments. So here I have on the screen a, uh, um, oh my goodness, I gotta get that up again. Um, there it is, a little blurry. Oh, come on, upload. Um, are you seeing a blurry image there, people? Uh, so what it is, is, is uh, they had two masses in, uh, in these tubes here. And uh, then they had 13 tons of mercury just below and just above these uh, these masses. And that's the together position. You see position T. And then they have uh, the position A, where the half of the mercury is, is uh, above and half of the mercury is below. And those weights there, they measured the, the force on those weights as the, the mass was above and the mass was below. And they found a difference. They found that when the mass of the mercury was above that, that top weight, that it had less force pulling down on it. And that when they had that, that bottom um, mass had more force pulling down on it when the, the mercury was apart. So this was evidence for mass attracting mass how would Could it just be explain anything sorry how, yeah go ahead that's that's it i was just gonna say could it be evidence of a greater column of energetic atoms on top of one mass of mercury versus the other i mean you know gravity is only need to explain why we have perfect little balls but if we're in a contained firmamental um, environment where everything's nice and stable, you're going to get stratification um, of density, energy, and all that stuff. If stuff is higher energy, it probably goes to the top of the medium of ether and air that we're in. And if it's lower energy, it probably sinks to the bottom. You know, no need for gravity to be pulling at the center of a ball or space-time curvature or whatever, you know, stuff they, you know, make up and stuff like that. Well, that's a good attempt. <laughs> it focuses on the interaction of the medium with the object that's in the medium, like fluid, like uh, the water that Tails was talking about. He was onto something. Maybe not water like aquatic water, maybe ether water, flowing around uh, and through everything. Still, still more assumptions, and and so un unless there's evidence, assumptions that are backed up by Sagnac, Michelson, Gale, and an interpretation that has flat Earth implications that may be rejected by heliocentrists, possibly. Yeah, that that uh, has been rejected. Yes, that you, you need you need some better evidence than that. Um, and this this At this is just a bunch of maybe. About is the all psychological that profile of these people making these theories and see what sort of theories they tend to create. At that point, it's a psychological um, spiritual issue, and you need to study their worldview. So that's another thing for another time. Yeah. I'm going to fix this image here a little bit. It's uh it's out a little. So, excuse me for a second here. I see gleam gleam still going on about something. Oh, all right, forget it. All right. Well, I linked you this uh this uh experiment here and uh um swirling masses or swirling ether and uh higher energy stuff and lower energy stuff doesn't uh doesn't really uh explain it away so um i'll give you a chance to uh to look at the uh the experiment and see what you think and um, um maybe have a better better take on it 
Well, um, I mean, you'll probably wrap it around the gravity paradigm. I'm going to wrap it around the flat Earth paradigm. So the paradigm that I'm coming from, I'm going to put that observation in a, a flat Earth house and just explain it using flat Earth theories. So it'll be interesting to see what we uh, come up with when uh, the schools of flat and heliocentric come back together, don't you think? Um, when they come back together? You bet. Um, It'll so, be a war for the very hearts and minds and souls of scientists. <laughs> um, yep. So that's that's uh, you maybe haven't seen that particular uh, gravity evidence, um, but uh, I think this was good. I, I read through the the entire um, publication there. It's pretty nice. Uh, it's 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 detailed. And um, but they're not, they're measuring the gra uh, universal gravitational constant, which is part of the law of gravitational attraction. You know, so um, they actually get a pretty close um, to the to other measurements in that one, it was um, which is which is good confirmation too. Um, well, theoretically, gravity has a couple problems. Um, you wouldn't have um, axial tilt with gravity. Um, the model that they use to model gravity is like a pail being swung around your head and then the water being kept in the pail like, you know, stuff being kept by gravity. But the thing is, notice how the pail never breaks off its string of gravity and uh, rotates it uh, t a 23.4 degree tilt to the uh, swing of the pale string. It's impossible. Yeah. You wouldn't have any actual spin at all. But but that's that's an analogy, and all analogies break down at some point, right? And so that one breaks down in that there isn't an actual string that's that's making it, uh, you know, face one direction, right? And the axial tilt is, is separate from the orbit. So physicists, astrophysicists, they don't have any problem with that. Uh, with what you said there, it, it's not it's not an issue. Well, for me, it breaks down so much I reject the model. On top of that, you have the sun whose heat would make it an expansive body of heat and would not make it an attractive force, not with that heat. It, all of its force of gravitation would be, you know, uh, kept in keeping it in a nice, uh, perfect ball. Um, and it wouldn't have any extra force left to attract not just one, but nine different planetary bodies in nine different ways. If that's the case, and it has this extra <laughs> leftover gravity, it would not have enough gravitational force to balance itself into a perfect ball. And so this gravitational force is a farce to uh, hold up the hold on, paradigm, hold on. Hold which is a shadow <laughs> Luciferian worship, Dude, because uh, the angels were beings of light and fire. Dude, that's not even right. Oh, yeah, this is no leftover. They're not worried about leftover gravity, right? It, it's universal, right? All matter in the universe attracts all matter. That's 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 how it works, right? So, yeah. Um, so, so let's so talk don't... about the medium that is universal, like ether. Let's talk about that and throw, you know, kick gravity to, to the curb. <laughs> but but mass still attracts mass. You still didn't didn't establish that it doesn't do that. What in the mass is doing the attracting? There's a lot in the mass. There's electricity in the mass. There's the, protons in the mass. There's yeah. neutrons in the mass. Yeah. What in the mass is doing the attracting? That's and, sloppy science to just the, leave it at mass attracts the mass. The cool thing about science is that you can write and you can explore it and you can have you can write a law without understanding why it happens. Right? Now, for example, Snell's law is something that until recently people didn't really have a great grasp on and even today physicists don't do a great job of it um there is a, a video by dr don lincoln from fermilab who uh recently put out a video covering snell's law and the mechanism by which it works and he goes over some of the historical reasons uh or explanations for it and how they're not correct and then he covers the correct one in some uh, abbreviated detail. So uh, Snell's law, though, was understood in how it functions long before it was understood in why it functions. And it doesn't matter. You can have um, you can have uh, oh, Gleam talking about Feynman diagrams. Super. Um, 
you can have an understanding of how it works without understanding why it works and you can write a law and and have it work so snell's law works we don't i don't understand why it works all the way but it works we don't need to so same thing with gravity we don't need to understand why it works to i to observe that it does work and and also observe that there are no uh exceptions where it does not work but you know take the the magic trick where you pull a, a, a rabbit out of the hat you can make a model that predicts that the rabbit is going to come out of the hat when it's really coming from under the table pragmatically it works just like the model that you're saying of gravity but it's not necessarily true you have to keep digging for the truth just in case you might have part of it right with the pragmatics but maybe there's a deeper truth that can be illustrated by an even better model i'd say like ether you know ether vortex gravity or whatever tesla um proposed ether vortex gravity saying that there was a swirling ether that was differentially absorbed into objects and flowing around objects that led to a downward vortex this seems to be uh corroborated or at least supported by the slinky the slinky when you drop it in slow motion it compresses and then it comes down as if the gravitational energy is being uh transmitted to the springs as they're going down and then after it's compressed it gets pulled down but gravity would predict the whole thing being pulled as a unit so maybe there's something to this ether vortex energy uh transmitting to gravity downward or something who knows yeah, and I've seen discussion of the slinky, and uh, it's predicted to function according to gravity, how we see it fun function, but it's complicated, and and at first at uh, at uh, first look it 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 isn't working how we would common sense think it would work, but people don't have a problem with it. Um, <clears throat> well, we get to a place where we have to reject these paradigms if they don't allow us to think differently in new ways and take new information. So maybe there's something to this flat Earth stuff, electric universe stuff, ether stuff. You know, maybe we need to rethink some of this stuff. And and here's the cool thing about science: there's an open invitation to to uh, debunk it. But but just saying I don't believe it, or maybe it's this, doesn't cut it, right? You need to actually... I reject it because of the worldview of the people that are pressing this model and the ways that it doesn't seem to work. You know, it doesn't seem to work with the slinky. It doesn't seem to work with the sun. It doesn't even seem to work in real life. You can drop an object and it will not accelerate downward 9.8 meters per second. They say, oh, that's in a vacuum. Well, I don't have a vacuum. In real life, something will probably fall in like three sixteenths of a second you know within six uh, uh six feet uh, in three sixteenths of a second or something like that jesse um jesse johnson goes over how gravity um doesn't work in regular real life by dropping an object and timing it he doesn't get 9.8 meters per second at all it's like six feet for in three sixteenths of a second if that whatever that is in meters but anyway the gravity doesn't seem to work so i i've i've not seen a a rigorous study of that uh, but i'd be willing to look at it and uh, I'm sure everybody in the scientific community would be excited like crazy to to see an actual study that that shows that gravity doesn't function like they think it is. Um, well, some would be um, glad, but some and, would panic and be like, I got to protect my paradigm, my career, oh, my no. funding. Here's what would and happen. So we're going to massage this oh, in or on. we're just going to deny it. This is what would happen. Whoever does that would be celebrated and would get a Nobel Prize. Absolutely get a Nobel Prize. And here's the thing you say, oh, they don't want to, they want to protect the, protect the current paradigm. No, that's not how it works. People, people do, you know, argue about it, but history, the, the history of science shows that all the time somebody comes along with a different idea that, that unseats other things. And then that person is celebrated. That's what Einstein did. Right? People, People didn't like him, especially Michelson. He didn't like what, what Einstein was doing. But in the end, Michelson got a Nobel Prize for his work on light. And his stuff on ether was was let go. And Einstein was accepted. Well, uh, people, you know, uh, talk about this kind of mysticization of science that came about with relativity. It gives you this ro rubber ruler that takes away objective uh, measurements and basically says you can take whatever measurement you want, you know, in physics. 
um, you know, everything's moving relative to everything else, but now you can't tell, you know, how to base your measurements. You know, he had two clocks that were moving differently and telling time differently because they're in, you know, two different, you know, movement systems, but he never said, okay, how do you uh, know which movement to base your clock off of? Most people use the earth as their uh, reference frame as if it is a set, unmoving standard anyway. You know, they, they, they give lip service to relativity, but it's like they, they actually make their measurements as if the earth is stationary and unmoving. And so Einstein didn't tell us, how do you tell which uh, me uh, system to base your measurements off of if everything's in motion? You know, and now we're in this paradigm where light, you know, doesn't change the way that it moves and the universe has to expand and contract to meet the light. This is, you know, uh, crazy. We're falling into this, this metaphysical world where, you know, nothing's definite and we're in multiple universes and stuff like that. You know, I mean, what happened to objective, hard, you know, physics and objective, hard measurements and objective, hard science? It's like it's kind of fallen to the wayside for a bunch of theoretical stuff. And general relativity might be part of that. The problem is, though, that general relativity works. Every time that they try to explore it and somebody wants to get their own Nobel Prize by showing that it's wrong, they just wind up providing more evidence for it. I just like to follow the censorship. Like, if science isn't giving us these ideas about the ether and stuff, I want to know why. Especially in this world of lies, follow the censorship. Well, it, Go it, to the ideas that you're not given and you're not allowed to look at. And well, you might find well, something... How are you not allowed to look at it? You can look at it. You can do your own experiment. Hmm. I haven't heard about the ether. I didn't hear about the ether as a, a, a working concept that Sagnac, Michael Samorley, and others proved. Um, I haven't heard about that evidence. But, I heard that my so Morley and them disproved the ether. I didn't hear the counter evidence that they proved it. I didn't hear about that. The, the reason why is because people didn't didn't think that they proved it. They think that all, after all of the work that the ether didn't exist. The, the, all of the scientists in the early 1900s that were in this, this field, they were looking at that. And the, the established ones, they liked the ether idea. And they want they kept trying to, to 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 support it and they didn't in the end all of them said you're we're we were wrong it wasn't ether and so that's why you haven't heard about it because they said that idea didn't work just like the old ideas about how there used to just be four or five different elements you know water fire earth you know stuff like that 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 only worked for so long and then they gave it up because um because it didn't work, right? And and instead we have, um, you know, our, our table of elements like we do today. Well, I mean, I saw a video by Pete and Pete uh, questioning whether water was water, as in, is it really hydrogen and oxygen atoms mixed together, or is it some sort oh, of? Oh, you hold on! <laughs> you can't be serious about those guys. Those guys are. That's just sarcasm, man. <laughs> It makes you think. I mean, uh, they said it's that the funny. hydrogen and oxygen that you get. But it is they funny. said that the hydrogen, well, the hydrogen and oxygen that you get may be from the electrode, and it may not necessarily be from the water qua water. Yeah. And when you combine yeah. hydrogen and oxygen together, you may be getting water, um, you know, from the air. You know, like condensed water that's cooling down from the air or something. Are you? You know, are so you, it hold on. You are you being serious right now? I can't tell, because this. I, it, it makes you think. I mean, maybe it is a primordial element that you just dissolve hydrogen and or oxygen in. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Did you take a chemistry class? I've heard the, the main line that it's hydrogen and oxygen, but it's always good to look at the um, I, alternative theory. I, I have no problem with looking at alternative theories, but but when you when you analyze it, right, you, you got to be serious to look at it. So what 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 real stuff is behind this did it come from the electrodes did it do this did no because you, you you can quantify these things you can measure these things it's been done many many times and and their understanding of it is is at such a basic level and i watch their video and i watch stuff where they're talking about measuring the weight of these uh canisters of of hydrogen and oxygen and there's so many things that they're not understanding in it that that it's just silly that's why I'm asking. Like, are you are you serious? Because it's it's not it's not good science. There, it's it's I I think it's just for the humor. Um, uh, 
good to question everything, but you know, we'll see. So, all right. So, did you take a chemistry class? Uh, I've taken one or two. One or two in high school. Oh, a long time ago. Okay. I um, studying electrical engineering had to take a whole ton of chemistry and physics and um tell you chemistry is fun until until they start getting into the math and, and deriving things then then oh, crap head spins it was fun uh fun stuff but uh head spins and um <clears throat> all right oh i have this here the um the the one nice thing about uh these different gravity where they're they're getting it the the, in, the uh, gravitational constant is seeing how close they come to to um, to each other because it's there's some disagreement in um, in their measurements so here is the, the same one the mercury one where we have um, a listing of several other um, experiments uh, measuring the the gravitational constant um, is that on your screen yet uh, hold on Let's come in. so um, of of all the gravi all of, of all the uh, the uh, universal constants the gravitational universal universal gravitational constant is the one that is the uh, it's on the, the the less known end of the spectrum, um, and the, the number of digits that they have in accuracy is is less than like the weight of the electron and stuff like that. But how can you determine this with like a torsion balance? I mean, there's no such thing as a perfectly you know balanced torsion balance. It's all in the casting. It's probably going to have a little more weight on this side versus that, which is going to lead to it you know turning in different ways, being unbalanced, and, and turning this way and that. You could get you know a, a turn from you know uh, like I said before, tectonic activity, a car passing by, wind, um, ether, and other things. I mean, it's just so specious this idea that mass attracts mass what is in the mass that's doing their tracking. Have they even found the Higgs boson? I mean, have they put this stuff in a jar? I've seen them put electricity in a jar. I haven't seen them put gravity in a jar. So it's a... hard for me to get past <laughs> the level of metaphysics and put rock solid physical faith in this thing that I have yet to see do anything but go down. Haven't seen it gone left. Haven't seen it gone right. Haven't seen it pull up. Haven't seen it pull at a slant. Haven't seen it in any universal form at all. Well, except that, that the majority of these experiments that we're looking at on the screen here are um, left-right, or not left-right, they are, the majority of them are torsion balance. Um, that's that's the most common one. And so you see where it says this work, um, the 2006 study, this work. Um, hold on, I'm getting my screen up the right way here so I can look at it and read it. There it is. Then uh, you, can, you see uh, 6.674. It's just a tiny bit over that. And then you see down a little bit farther one that says Gundlach and Merkowitz. Um, that one was from the year 2000 and that was a, a very good high quality one from the University of Washington where they had that is the second closest to date uh, most um, confident um, value for it. It's a little more accurate than uh, this this uh, Mercury one, but they're both very close to each other and in, in a very tight agreement. So how do you use a torsion bar and how do you know that a car driving by? Well, that's the cool thing. These studies um, are published and you can see what they did. And so here I, I pasted in chat again the um, the study to the uh, 2000, I think it's the year 2000, from the University of Washington. And they used uh, torsion balance in a vacuum on a, uh, they, they do a, a bunch of things to make sure that cars driving by don't affect it. They take values over a long period of time, many, many times. 
and they they take the outliers and they use statistical uh, mechanisms to get rid of the outliers so that um, the car driving by or somebody jumping on the floor uh, causes an anomaly and pushes and then they, they they take that out right so um, again uh, if if you want to propose an alternative to gravity the establishment is ready for that and they they welcome it and uh oh, that's, go that ahead. hasn't been my experience they've, they've suppressed cancer cures they weren't ready for that they've suppressed alternative you know views as to what happened you know during political events like 9 11 and other things if anything the pattern has been brutal suppression a fight a war followed by grudging acceptance so we'll see not not in the realm of science In, in the realm of science, right? The realm the, of science as well. The the entrenched people, of course, have have their their favorite things, like Michelson did. Um, and uh, you know, he teamed up with uh, several people in different experiments. But in the end, like I said, he said, "Yeah, no ether." He he was the one championing ether, and in the end, he said, "Yeah, there there's no evidence." I spent he spent a ton of his career trying to find evidence for ether and came up empty and he admitted that and he got a nobel prize for his work on light right so good for him that all of this effort that he put into to trying to discover it he he pushed that forward and and in the end it so much of what he did supported relativity in the end hmm so the, those well, two articles, I'll, I'll, I'll paste also that, that second one in there for you. Um, there, these are just two um, on my website, uh, mctune.net slash gravity. I have, I have a, a good bunch of resources. Um, if you've not watched the Feynman lectures on uh, the law of gravitational attraction, or he, he calls it... Um, I forgot what he calls it on the something about a law and a natural law a good video in there i have a link to the papers 170 papers that have come out of ligo all talking about um gravitational waves um give you a link you could purchase your own uh torsion bar experiment it's about a thousand dollars so uh not a lot of us gonna go pop for that the two, the two uh, torsion bar experiments that are very accurate, the, the one from 2000 from the um, um, University of Washington is in there, and then another one that came out of uh, China that has, um, they use two different met methods to find, uh, to find it in, in a slightly tighter uncertainty, so good for them. Uh, and uh, so I'll put that in uh, the description. Um, I welcome you to uh, or any flat earthers to have a look and and see why gravity doesn't exist or why there is no supporting evidence for it not existing so well it's just interesting to look into some of these alternative theories go back to the ether and you know maybe some of the other stuff that science you know th you know thought it left behind maybe uh, an error yeah and like I said you know, if you find something, bring it up. Do something with it. If it's real, it's worth something. It's worth looking into, and and you know, some people will will resist it. But if you have a good, solid thing, a good experiment, good evidence, something written up, do the work on it. People will take it. I'll take it if it's good. But so far. You have what if, maybe, it could be ether. We've got other flat earthers saying that density and buoyancy do it, or a de um, relative density, which is, you know, it's more than maybe, <laughs> but it's funny, because uh, cause, uh, density is in uh, kilograms per meter cubed, and uh, acceleration is meters per second squared. So they're not the same units even. So our uh, 
um, dimensional analysis falls short. We don't even need to go any further. So. Hmm. Hmm. But if, well, you know, if you got something. I, I probably talked about the, the medium affecting the object in the medium versus this um, occult gravity force pulling to the center of a ball. See, by labeling it occult, you're, you're kind of letting your, you're putting your, your bias right out there. Um, mm. and, and right, because you, you're, you're already, you're already dismissed it without being an open, having an open mind about it because you are assuming I mean, that, that it has some sort of a nefarious purpose to it where for the most part, scientists, you know, they, they may be motivated by selfishness because they want to get some accolades for themselves, but in the end, they know that they need to have something that works in order to get those accolades. Not something that is Luciferian or malicious in some way. Well, it makes you think that some of this stuff has a uh, occult source when you have 666 feet of curvature per 100, um, 666 inches of curvature per 100 miles when you have like 66.6 degrees of tilt if you subtract 90 from 23.4 um and you have the earth so these these are, just, these are just these are just things that you've you've people have looked for hold, hold on but, but, I, i've seen those numbers before and it's just an arbitrary number if, if i want to pick a number that i want to shake out of something i can do that too right and if you want proof of that just go to russian vids channel he shakes 33 out of everything it doesn't matter if i wanted to prove weird al was behind everything i could find 27 in everything just saying it's something to file away i mean it just makes you think i mean all these sixes really i can file it away got right here there you go. Um, it, it, it's it's arbitrary. Like like you have to pick, you have to pick the sixes. You have to f find them, right? Like I said, I can find a twenty seven if you want, right? That there's a certain number of inches after a certain number of feet in drop. You're gonna have twenty seven. So. So, anyway, um. You got anything else? Um, we're at two hours here. Uh, other than that, uh, the sky would be purple, not blue, based off of purple uh, refracti um, refracting the most. Um, the blue color leads one to believe that there's waters above the firmament or something when it should be uh, purple uh, refracted light instead of blue. Other than that... Um, Let's see what else is there. Space is looking kind of fake with the water bubbles in space, making it look like they're in a tank. Um, the rockets that appear to go up and curve and uh, go back down to Earth, making it look like, you know, NASA's faking it. Um, the right, Photoshop on, images. That, was, that's a long list. We, we, we can't cover all of them. Uh, do you want to pick oh, one? Sorry. Uh, the purple light that you'd expect with uh, purple refracting uh, more readily than blue. But the blue color seen because of the waters above the firmament. Yeah, I went over this with uh, why you are an idiot. I think I said that right. Sometimes I just call him by his surname. Oh, first, NANA uh, -N -A says $6.66, Hail Satan. So, um, super. I filed that. <laughs> Hold on. Right, that's right here. Right there. Um, thank you, NA, NA. Um, Mr. It, no, I won't say it. Uh, why You Are an Idiot um, said that the sky is blue because because the water behind the firmament is blue. Um, but water's not blue. <laughs> water is clear. Um, I thought that was fun. Do you, do you think water's blue? We seem to have gone quiet. Maybe there's an issue with the stream here. Oh, sorry, I was on mute. But oh, um, okay. like you say, uh, uh, yeah, water is uh, clear as far as I I can tell myself. It's probably blue from the firmament or some sort of other source. But um, 
notice from NASA, they always give us those blue pictures like it's blue water. So something's blue. What, what blue water, pictures? Water, clouds, whatever. Uh, NASA gives us uh, pictures with blue water. Uh, oh, from space? You yes. Mean? Yeah, like because uh, uh, like yeah. on the screen I have uh, the pictures from the Himawari Eight on the screen. Yeah. 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 Again, it's 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 the the optical effects. That's well understood. Um, I don't think I'm uh, I'm I'm gonna be able to have any uh, reasonable conversation myself with uh, whether it should be purple or blue. I haven't heard that before. That's interesting, but uh, if. If you had uh, if you had something on that, I'd look at it. But the the problem is the, the firmament where there's no evidence of that. Um, so so far, it's just an assumption. <laughs> All the breadcrumbs well, point to a firmament. Mister Mister Unite yeah, for the hold, hold hold on a second. Mister Unite for the children uh, wanted to interject. He said water is actually purple according to the mind of Prince. Um, I'm from Minneapolis. Uh, I never really was a big fan, but uh, people here loved Prince. And uh, when when he passed, the entire town was purple. Like all the buildings just lit up purple. It was pretty pretty cool. Um, all right, go ahead, go ahead, Lemon. I was just gonna say, there's um, breadcrumbs that lead to the firmament. Um, you have uh, rainbows which look like they're shining through the firmament. You have uh, sun dogs, which look like light coming through Ooh, from hold a Hold on, that's a good one. Hold, hold on, sun dogs. I love sun dogs. I took a picture of one myself. This isn't a picture that I took, but this sun dog is very nice where you see that the optical effect causing sun dogs is between the light source and your eye, not bouncing off the back of the firmament. So I don't know if you're seeing that on the stream yet, but uh, sun dogs are ice crystals in the air. And it's happening between the light source and your eye. Uh, you also have um, L's and sprites that appear to be electrical phenomena going up and hitting some sort of solid firmamental barrier. And you also have chunks of it that appear to fall off in the form of meteorites, which are covered in some sort of uh, glass-like casing. Interesting. And also you have laser guided so um, stars. Time. Well, also you have laser guided stars where they point lasers up into the sky to make star like effects uh, by heating up the sodium that they say is floating up in the atmosphere. I would say it's sodium that is embedded in the solid firmament dome. So it looks like you're getting a bunch of uh, breadcrumbs that are leading to some sort of solid barrier to our world. And also you can't have air pressure without a container. You can't even oh, have a vacuum on. without a container unless it's under controlled lab conditions where the vacuum is sealed and contained. All right, so it, it, you're, you're kind of bouncing a little bit here. So you didn't quite address the sundog picture that I have up on the screen here. So you, you said sundogs was uh, evidence for a dome. Is Looking at this picture, is this picture a sundog evidence for a globe or a dome? Uh, let me see here. You said sun dogs. What? So, um, so, uh, Lemon, your your name is, uh, Arave Enlay. Is that correct? Lemon's good. No, no, no. Uh -huh. um, but you're you're posting in chat, and so somebody you posted your last video thing, and somebody I think misunderstood it. So, can you post that again? Um, and don't and don't uh, uh, na na don't don't uh, block him. That that's okay. Let it through. He's, it's just the, uh, sure. the, the YouTube um, ID link. Um, looks like a sun dog. You're saying it's an optical phenomenon on the eye? Uh, no, it's between the light source and the eye. It's, uh, the explanation is that it's, it's ice crystals in the air, and it's refracting and ref or more, uh, sorry, reflecting inside the ice crystals. If that so, were the case, you'd have an individual sun dog with each ice crystal. You have what appears to be a very solid phenomenon off of a curved dome barrier. 
And you no. can even duplicate the effect off of a glass, off of a curved uh, uh, metal uh, bowl or a curved glass surface. Okay, so so you still didn't address the what we're seeing here in front of the mountain here. Okay, it looks like a sun dog. Yeah, you see the, the, the left side of that, the, the sun dog is in front of the mountain, between the observer and the mountain. And the right side, you, you can't tell where it is. Yeah, the ice crystals can uh, be like a screen of the projected image, but the original image appears to be a curved, you know, dome structure of some sort. I mean, at best, the uh, ice crystals or the water in the air would be a screen for it, but it wouldn't cause the phenomenon. Otherwise, you'd have it uh, made by each individual ice crystal. All right. So that didn't explain why it's happening between, you know, in front of the mountain there. And you and it also... It's just the screen that is being uh, that uh, the image is being projected on the screen. There's the no ice screen. crystals are between the mountain, yes, but the image comes from the curved glass surface. It's just projected onto the screen of the ice crystals. But the ice crystals are not originating the phenomenon. The origination of the phenomenon is the curved dome projecting the image onto the ice crystals as a that, screen i'm sorry that doesn't really make any sense but uh, the other part yes. the the Otter each individual there's a, a screen and the ice crystals can act as a screen too that you can project stuff off of yes oh that is that's that's a that's a dig man that's you're digging deep for that one because because when i've when i've i think you just made that up right because most of the time people say that the sun dogs is you know you're seeing the sun reflecting off the back of the dome and now you changed it all of a sudden yeah uh the lights being uh, uh refracted through the um, curved glass surface onto the screen of the ice crystal the ice crystals are now screens Yes, mist can be a screen that you can project stuff off of, like a like a rainbow or a sun dog. So, are you saying that rainbow is something's being projected on a rainbow, and it's not uh, it's not light? The rainbow is being droplets? refracted through the uh, uh, curve uh, firmament dome onto the screen of the water droplets. Wow. So, so there's a. Yeah, AT2 uh, saying, please ask where the screen between the camera and the mountains to the left. And and so, yeah. The I'm ice gonna... crystals in the that are between the mountain yeah, and yeah. the observer. But 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 what I'm wondering is is where where how is that originating? This this isn't making any sense. Coming from the dome projected onto the screen of the ice crystals. Yeah, could, Very has anybody done any does anybody done any 3D modeling of this? Because this doesn't make any sense, and I and I would doubt very much that any 3D modeling would work. And why don't we see it all the time? Why depends on it... the angle you are to the screen. No, but but why? What? Why don't we say see the the sun dogs bouncing off uh, the back of the dome on uh, on warm days? Is there enough of a screen in the air? enough you know mist water droplets or whatever okay, in the so, air to act so so the confusion i think i'm seeing here is is what what is the sun dog what are you claiming that the sun dog is that it's uh, it's a reflection off, off of the curved glass surface okay so projected if it's projected onto the ice crystal yeah that projected on the ice crystal part doesn't make sense why not because if if it was projected off of the uh, uh, a dome, we would see it, and it would go to um, the dome, right? Uh, the the light would go from the sun backwards towards the dome, bounce off the dome, and then come to our eyes. Why do you need a screen? Right. It's it's the the, the the screen that 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 you're that I'm getting confused on, um, and I don't know if you're talking. Maybe you muted yourself again. No, just oh, um, the thing is this light coming off of the dome being projected onto what appear to be the ice crystals. 
there are other videos of uh, sun dogs as well that are up in the sky. Yeah, and I've 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 seen those. I took one myself. So, <clears throat> uh, see, we got Jeffrey. Ooh, great check. Is that how you say it, right, buddy? I don't I don't want to get it wrong. Sorry. Uh, it's been entertaining. Workarounds and leftover gravity and six 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 sounds like really solid science to me. Thanks. You're welcome, and thank you, Jeffrey. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, a lot of assumptions and maybes is is an right and and i'm not against uh f an alternative um just it needs to make sense so somebody's talking about uh mind of god is saying something here just a second yeah peter g you can create a rainbow with water hose and appropriate nozzle uh, and a bright light indoors so no dome needed yeah and that's definitely the case uh why use gay relationship as an insult so dark seed so yeah dark seed whoever don't be calling people stuff all right grow up a little uh so at2 and the shills um as a why is ice less dense than than the air um yeah i don't i don't know if this sundog thing makes uh, is going to go anywhere. So you had another point. One more thing, maybe we could go over. Uh, you listed uh, off a couple things. So we say them again, and I'll pick out the one I was thinking of. Uh, talked about purple being expected instead of blue, pointing to possible bluish waters above the firmament or the bluish dome. Uh, the sun dogs, rainbows, sprites, elves. I love sprites and, what, and elves. Be a permanent area. Yeah. They are quite cool, but they appear to go up and hit a, a solid barrier. No, uh, what you you said another thing there. Uh, what else is there? Hey, the mind of god. Uh, Don't call Brian Peck an idiot. That's all gravy. <laughs> it's a good it's a um Brian Peck um and and the mind of god are going back and forth about stuff and and uh Brian Peck is, I don't know if you've seen this, Lemon Bird. Uh, Brian Peck is saying, why does the Bible have the incorrect value for pi? Have you have you heard about that? What does it say, like three? Yeah, it says, well, it, it uses the uh, the dimensions of, uh, of a big bowl in Solomon's temple. Um, was it Solomon's temple? It was in a temple, yeah, I think Solomon's. Anyway, um, and that it's uh, five cubits from the middle to the outside and then 30 all the way around the outside um and if that were the case then uh pi would be equal to three because the correct amount would be rounded would be 31 um not 30 so not close enough as an approximation yeah and and, and i i take that as an approximation as well and for that i say super the the bible isn't a science text so Clifford Reynolds, the mind of God, hates a gaze, apparently. Well, take it somewhere else if you're going to be talking about that. Well, does he hate gaze or does he love what God's word is saying? Um, Christians are being, you know, asked to compromise, especially the word with um, passages, you know, like this or that. Um, you know, love all people, you know, but, you know, if we're putting, you know, the world before God, that's going to be a problem. We got to find out what God says, even if it's stuff that we don't like. Even if it may or may not affect you uh, personally. I myself am a, am a homosexual, but uh, God's will be done. Okay. Well, um, interesting. I, I do, I do uh, appreciate in the Bible where, um, where Jesus was brought somebody that was uh, doing the wrong thing and and uh, rather than condemn her, he said, "Whoever didn't sin, you, you can you can start right." And everybody left. So um, I think that's a good way to treat people. So um, as long as we put God first and not the world, otherwise we're all going to go to hell one way or another. All right. Uh, th there was something else, uh, but I can't I can't remember it. 
that you that you went over I thought was was interesting. Uh what else was there? Oh yes, the laser guided star formation, uh shooting lasers up into the sky to make stars to excite the sodium atoms that are up there. Uh, uh, suspended in the atmosphere, I would argue that the sodium atoms are suspended in the dome. And they're probably exciting the sodium atoms up in the solid firmament. Um, <laughs> uh, the shills, yes. Go ahead. Um, hmm? Uh, the shills asked me a question. So, yes, he uh, uh, the um, the shills is uh, look a pig. He's saying uh, can we can have a after show on the UDSA server. Um, so yeah, set that up. People are welcome to come in there. That might be good. Uh, Lemon, if you're if you're interested. So oh, DJ Torque, you got it. Air pressure without a container. That was I that was it. the one. So, so I love that one because, um, I love it when I hear air pressure without a container, because there's no doubt from when, when you're, uh, when you're at sea level, there's a certain air pressure. And when you climb a mountain and your ears pop, right, there's a different air pressure at the top of the mountain. So where is the container between the bottom of the mountain and the top of the mountain that uh, allows that difference in pressure. I said for there to be air pressure, period, you need to have a container. I didn't preclude gradients. There are, are naturally going to be gradients because you're going to have more columns sandwiched on top of each other toward the bottom of the column than at the top. If you take a graduated cylinder and fill it with water, poke three holes going down the graduated cylinder, the hole in the top is going to have water squirting out of it with the least amount of force. The hole at the bottom will have it squirting out with the most amount of force because of the atom sandwich on top of it in the contained system. So you're naturally going to have pressure gradients, but to have pressure gradients, period, you need to have containment. And you can't even have a vacuum in an open air system. A vacuum is a highly artificial environment that needs to be maintained in lab conditions. You need to have a seal for a, a vacuum seal to have a vacuum containment. Otherwise, there is no vacuum. So you need a container for pressure and a vacuum, which points to a firmamental uh, barrier covering our world. At so least now, in part. Yeah. So who who says that there is not a pressure gradient going on indefinitely? That that is the claim. There is a pressure gradient that begins at at, at sea level or or lower, right? and continues up and the pressure gradient never stops being a gradient. It's always some pressure. The, the heliocentric assumption is that this uh, gradient continues to zero uh, uh, vacuum. No, uh, no, uh, flat uh, it does not go to zero. It goes to zero by the uh, dome barrier that starts the uh, column of atoms going down. But, but the heliocentric model doesn't, doesn't go to zero. It never hits zero. A semantic shift is saying that it goes basically to a vacuum toward close to zero. It a goes vacuum close to zero, but it's still a gradient, which you allowed. Uh, a gradient under a dome. But you still because have... Because to have pressure, period, you still need to have containment. Otherwise, the pressure would just disperse and you wouldn't have uh, much pressure at all. So, So explain how there is a gradient then. It's just a, a column of atoms that are sandwiched on top of each other. Less yeah, but, at the top, more at the bottom. Less but, pressure but, at the top, more pressure at the bottom. Yeah, but what causes the less at top, less at the top, and more at the bottom? Uh, you have an electric atmosphere toward the top as you increase in elevation. You have more electrical energy toward the top, probably toward the uh, dome. Um, but you also but have uh, gases that are cycling in and out of living creatures at the bottom of uh, said. Uh, uh, um, uh, gradient at the bottom you have living things that are respiring transpiring giving off gases okay. absorbing right. gas leak. so yeah um, so you have the, a bunch ho of hold on a second how, how long how long should it take for a pressure that's down low to get equalized up high like as long as it takes to drive up the mountain well um 
experimentally, uh, whenever a vacuum is put next to a pressurized system, the pressurized system empties more or less immediately into the vacuum until it equalizes. Okay, so, so I guess immediately. So the 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 differential um, between the 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 high pressure <clears throat> at sea level and the lower pressure up the mountain should almost immediately equalize, according to you. Yet it, it doesn't. Um, it never equalizes. Well, at the top of the well, mountain, the pressure stays regularly or, or consistently at the same pressure with slight variations all the time. So, all right, uh, let me say well, something while, while I'm on here. Um, uh, Hannah Anderson says, shout out to UMC Tune. Great discussion with civility. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, uh, so, yeah, what what is it? What, why is it that, that the pressure doesn't equalize like right away? Uh, because we're in a contained fundamental system where gradients and homeostatic pressure can be established in each layer. Otherwise, all the um, the um, the atmosphere would be uh, put in the vacuum by uh, liquid dynamics. It would pull and flow on itself into the vacuum, just like when you know a uh, water flows, it pulls on itself, and by fluid dynamics, once the flow is started, it just flows out of its container. The same with the atmosphere, but with fluid dynamics, once um, an opening to the berry, uh, to the um, uh, vacuum is established, it would just empty out into the vacuum in all directions. That has been the precedent. There's been no precedent for an open vacuum system existing next to um, a, a pressurized container. And if we're going to get metaphysical like that and assume that things that uh, we have demonstrated, uh, uh, that we haven't demonstrated can somehow happen, let's start believing in the metaphysics of God and believe in uh, the God that we can't necessarily demonstrate um, uh, experimentally either if we're going to believe in a vacuum system next to a pressurized system that hasn't been demonstrated. Um, I'm sorry, that didn't, it wasn't really a very predictive uh, model for what what would cause cause that to happen. E electricity? would cause less air up at, at altitude? Electricity causes um, substances to become more reactive. Um, it can heat up substances, you know, cause them to become more reactive, which may lead to, you know, some weird stuff happening with the okay. pressure. So, too. So, so let's yeah, not go, stuff. hold on. G, um, energy um, values, so they're going to stratify based off of energy levels. Yeah, yeah okay, also. well, let, let's, can can we quantify that more than just saying maybes and stuff? Because, you know, we have a, a as, as people, we've explored how electricity works and interacts with things, and, and we have things like Coulomb's Law that allows us to calculate the force on objects uh, based on electrical charge. So can we use Coulomb's Law to predict this? Uh, depending on the gas that's up there in that layer, mm, probably. Probably. All right. So we're back to the same thing. It's a probably maybe thing. Um, and and maybe maybe it'd be good to have a little more work on that before making claims because. Um, oh hey, Chris Berry, how you doing? Um. <clears throat> Maybe uh, I, I do need somebody for next week, uh, Chris Berry, or uh, who was the other guy? Maybe I uh, would be good. Um, <clears throat> next Tuesday, 8 Central. Not when, Today's Wednesday, I know, but uh, Tuesdays. Um, so, again, I'd love to see some work on it. Maybe it just doesn't cut it because we do have the predictive model that does work and does predict it. Um, and, and so you kind of have to do better than maybes and, and, and stuff and come up with a solid, um, you know, a real predictive model. Right. And, and, and I, I, I think you probably, I'm guessing because of the, the math that I think that you've done, you probably could do well with Coulomb's law. So, um, you know, maybe look it up and, and, uh, put something together, but, uh, mm -hmm. You know, Chris Berry is saying, saying gas pressure gradient is caused by temperature variation. But, Chris, I'm sorry, it would equalize quickly, as we've already established and Lemon Bird agreed to. So unless you don't think that things would, uh, air pressures would uh, equalize quickly. 
Well, with the sun passing overhead, it's probably heating up, you know, uh, different layers differently as it's passing over overhead. But but, but at night, we'll that pressure is still, that pressure differential is still there at night. Right? Well, in that case, it would probably be the stacking of the atoms on top of each other. Yeah, but now you're, you know, it's back to why does it go down? And if it's, I'll accept that it goes down because of gravity, and then I'm totally with you, but... But, it goes uh, down because there's a lower um, layer of gas, um, a thinner layer of gases at the top. But why is there a thinner layer of gas at the top? Gases naturally settle, settle in their energy layer, stacking on top of each other. Just what but they do. But why? <laughs> it's circular, man. There are energetic atoms that settle on top of each other and stratify based off of energy. Uh, more energetic atoms go to the top and are probably thinner and move around more. Uh, while thicker, grosser atoms that move around less are at the bottom, hey, as you hey, would expect. Do you think uh, they like being called atoms. gross? Those atoms. Huh? I've met a lot of people named Adam, and they don't appreciate being called gross. Uh, just a second. Um, uh, <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, the mind of God. Um, he, he's getting timed out here, um, and I see you're, you're talking a little bit more than uh, rude than you normally do. So, Mind of God, maybe you can tone it down a little. I love having you in here. Um, and, and mods, try to... I don't know. Can you... Can you, can you Mind of God, can you stop at, uh, insulting people? That'd be good. Um, so, Hashtag, we can do this. Yes, that would be nice. So, um, All right, and uh, Chris Berry, seriously, send me an email. mctune at mctune.net. I'd love to have you on. Um if we can have a conversation like Lemon Bird and I, uh, where we don't have to have a moderator and we don't get talking over each other. Uh, but it's, it's been about two and a half hours and it's probably a good time to, uh, to start wrapping here. Oh, I've got how the time fly. Uh, yes. Do you, uh, do you work tomorrow? Oh, I'm probably going to do some research. Probably research. Okay. Do you, do you mind saying what you do? Uh, right now in between uh, positions. Okay, okay. Well, I hope you get something. I've been uh, myself writing anti-spam software for quite a while, so... Uh, uh, nice. Yeah. I see a lot of... Thank you, for, of keeping our, uh, thank you yeah. for keeping our computer free of spam. What were you saying? Sorry. I see, I see a lot of scam emails and uh over the several years that i've been writing anti-spam software my spidey sense has gotten very active and uh so when when i first started seeing some flat earth stuff my spidey sense started going crazy i'm like wait a second this is like all that other stuff i see every day so well i thought uh opportunity to get back to the creator that we've denied with uh, mainstream science for years it seems like uh, mainstream science is on a uh, hellish crusade to deny the scriptures at every turn uh, the earth is older than they think we're not made in the image of god but a monkey you know uh the flood is denied for this um you know uh time column that takes millions of years to you know uh, uh you know settle like dust from the air instead of you know being an obvious flood layer with upside down trees inside of it you know stuff like that yeah um let me say that that there are um a lot of uh religious positions that 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 don't mind having um uh more of the traditional scientific um uh acceptance or position right so there is a podcast called unbelievable where uh this this guy interviews um different people and uh often he has had christians on that that are uh not young earth guys that uh that totally go for the big bang um and uh so there's there's not just um one way to look at it if you uh if you know well, I mean, we may be getting, you know, enemy ideology that may be, you know, used to promote atheism and, you know, turn people from the faith. So just, you know, Christians might need to look out for that. And that's all. Yep. Well, all right. Uh, anything you want to say uh, before we go? 
Look into the flat earth um, before Google censors it and gives you nothing but, you know, debunk or crappy content at the top. Looking like the 10th or 20th, you know, search result page to, you know, finally get some decent results if you can. Um, fight Google censorship in this age of lies and deceit. Follow the censorship and you might find a nugget of truth. All right. And I would say stay in school. Um, uh, let's see. The mind of God saying, I won't join you because you idiots. Stop saying idiots. Come on, that's part of it. Time people out every two seconds. You morons are making your government proud. Well, the mind of God um, and on the UDSA server, uh, you, you will not get uh, timed out. And uh, I'll review this, uh, mind of God, the, uh, the some of the stuff here and, and see if I thought it was good or not for them to uh, to time you out. Uh, uh. <laughs> sorry um uh, mind of god i will uh email me or message me somewhere but uh uh we'll get this we'll talk about this a little bit but please do join the uh the the after show on the discord server the link is in the just um right here um that the shills has put in and marvel girl has also put in a couple times and uh lemon bird if you're if you want are, are you on the udsa server uh i believe i am i'll have to look through i just accept channel invites and stuff yeah just check. right now the icon is three just outlines of people um so interest and it says udsa on the bottom so there it is link to the after show all right everybody thank you very much and uh we will you know, people always say we'll see you next time. I won't see you next time. I'll be looking at a camera like like I am right now next time. So next time I'll be looking at a camera too. Bye. Later.